Welcome to DAX Machina. Together, we'll explore the writings of D.A. Roberts along with other authors, with a particular emphasis on the horror genre. We'll discuss writing, the inspiration behind horror stories as well as the possibility that monsters might not be safely locked away in the pages of fiction. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us on our 14th installment of the DAX Machina Show. Uh, joining me, as usual, is my partner in crime, Steve Wildman Monrotis. And joining us in the, tonight in the studio is the one and only Sean Chesser. Uh, Sean is the master of the military zombie thriller. I absolutely love his books. Uh, Steve's a big fan of his now. And uh, I, I think you guys will be, too. If you guys are a fan of my, of my Codename Wild Hunt series, you are definitely going to love Sean's books. Uh, his action is second to none he, he he's a, he is the man when it comes to action sequences uh so sean uh take it away i'd like you to introduce yourself and tell the folks where they can find your stuff and i will be posting the links in the chat well first off thanks for the kind words i appreciate that um nice to meet you fellas in the, in the sort of flesh the digital flesh i guess for the first time um man i you know i just i started writing uh in about 2000 well i wrote a little bit in high school but i started writing in 2000 10, you know, trying to finish something for the first time ever, you know, I was always Mr. Half Step, you know, I'd go halfway and finish and, and quit. And I finished Trudge and showed it to some people and uh, some people said, hey, it's pretty good, needs some polishing and found an editor, a little bit, a little bit of help. And, uh, and then I guess the rest is history. You know, I published Trudge and and went from there. I, I just, I just love to, to do it. It takes me away, you know, it's an escape. Trudge is one of the first zombie novels I read, and it's really what made me love love the the written zombie genre. I mean, I was a fan of zombie books since I, I mean, zombie movies since I was a kid, and I've loved everything horror that I could get my hands on. But I hadn't really read any zombie books until I read it was um, uh, Max Brooks' uh, Zombie Survival Guide, then your book. And that's yeah, there wasn't there wasn't a lot out back then, was there? There was no, know, there wasn't some, much. Z A Rex, and there was you know Jailborn, and there was McKinney, and there was a few, but. I, I wrote the book for myself, basically, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Cade, Cade Grace Gray is my boy, Cade Gray Chester. So my, my protagonist is Cade Grayson, and my daughter's name is Raven. So I threw a Raven in there, and she doesn't like being Cade's daughter in the book. But <laughs> that's okay. Elder sister will deal with it. Absolutely. So, you know, finishing something was a big, big, big deal. We uh we kind of have something of a tradition on the show. Anytime somebody gives us a like or a love, we always take a drink. Uh, sometimes when we're when we're drinking whiskey, that can get a little little problematic. But we've already got a couple of likes from Roger Peacock and Franklin Franklin Wales. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I'll slanjima with coffee. Cheers. I was uh, I was on the uh, on the air last night with. Um, what was it called a zombie round table? And it was from all the authors from the zombie book of the month club. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Alan Gamboa told me to tell you hi. Ah, and, yeah, uh, Alan. Cool. <laughs> and uh, I, ironically, uh, you and Alan and JL Bourne are my three favorite zombie authors. Oh, honored, man. You, honored. It was and we just to, picked uh, up a, a love from the general, Josh. I remember Dalton. picking up JL Bourne's book at, at, a, at a Barnes and Noble, seeing it on the shelf. And, you know, you didn't see many on the shelf. And, tore through that day by day Armageddon just like <laughs> yeah I, I read I read it like I think in a single setting man when he the first time he ever commented on one of my posts on Facebook I just about crapped myself I fanboyed and I swear to God his response back was dude I put my pants on one leg at a time <laughs> <laughs> you know I find that I find that a lot that reaction a lot among the indie crowd whatever they 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 make a friend that's an established author I, I have that same reaction i mean i have a total geek out moment yep. like like that when you accepted my friend request i was like holy shit i mean i felt like john belushi on animal house <laughs> yeah well, the world war convention was here a few years ago and i shared a table with uh, mark tufo and john o'brien first nice. time i ever met those fellas and they're both great fellas salt of the that's earth awesome and then we got invited, you know, the indie dudes, and there was some established, a lot of established authors there, you know, Craig DeLuey and Joe McKinney and uh, uh, Weston Osh. I always ruin his last name, Oshis or Ochase. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, we go to the Stanford's over there and have have lunch with all these guys, and I'm sitting next to Joe McKinney, and all I all I ask him about is uh, stuff about policing and about cop cars, and I, I don't even ask about writing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's a San Antonio detective or he's a supervisor, but uh, same no, thing, you know. Joe McKinney was the 
uh, Joe McKinney was the first uh, zombie author that I read. Uh, I had picked up uh, the first wor- uh, book in his uh, his uh, Dead World uh, series, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I, I became a big fan. I, I love that he wrote it from like the tactical viewpoint. Because you know, I I'd seen I, like I'm a huge fan of George Romero. I had the honor of meeting him before he died, and and you know, yeah, you know, I'm used to the you know, the the Kirkman Romero you know stuff. Right, but right. You know, your books and McKinney's and of course DA's, they they're uh, I think somebody phrased them as a thinking man zombie book. You know, it's like the the real world. It's it's not like running away wearing high heels, tripping and getting eaten. You know, it's like, dude. Um, there's an abandoned cop car. It has weapons. I'm taking them. Yeah. I'm going to need them. There aren't going to be any more. You know, it's th- this pack rat stuff, and it, it makes it more believable. Yeah, my you know, character work smarter, board. not harder, is what Kate Grayson like. I like to have him say, "Work smarter, not harder." You know. Yeah. My main my main character went into full blown scavenger mode as soon as soon as the shit hit the fan. Oh my god, your 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 main character is a hoarder. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, you know, I remember reading the early Ragnarok stuff, and I was like, "Oh, he's he's now carrying five weapons platforms. Awesome! He might need one." Of them. You know? <laughs> he wasn't carrying them all at the same time. I know. He had, he I had know. gear in the in the Humvee. Yeah, I mean, when my father oh. passed two years ago, the, the stuff he left me combined with my stuff, I, it's coming out the seams at my house. So I'd be the same way. <laughs> what what do I leave behind? Got a comment in the in the chat. Uh, whoever whoever that is, if you go to Facebook, I, I'm, I'm sorry, streamyard.com slash Facebook, it'll allow, allow you to authorize them to use your name so we'd know who you are. Uh, just says Facebook user at the moment. It says, Sean, I've always been a fan of yours and McKinney and DAs. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, constant readers are what keep us keep us going, you know. And Absolutely. Uh, word of mouth and, and reviews, of course, it's gold to us independent authors. It's gold to all authors, but, you know, it's, it helps a lot get ex- us, us get, ex- um, you know, found found out on a, on a sea of, of people, you know. It's a Absolutely. big tent, which is good. I like the fact that there's lots of us on there writing zombie stuff, but it's good to have people talk about us. I thought about talking to you and a couple other guys uh, that we write similar styles uh, to like exchange um, advertisement pages Mm -hmm. and put, you know, put up an ad for you in the back of my books and just kind of advertise around for each other. Yeah, that that would be a, it it works. I mean, I've got, we we have that thing going on with John O'Brien and, Mm -hmm. um, and Tufo. We we do that in most of our books, not all of them, but we, we do that swap thing. But yeah, maybe something we could talk about. I'd definitely be up for that. But definitely, uh, the word yeah. of mouth between authors is something that we oh, absolutely. All, all do, and I find some are standoffish, you know. And not that I go knocking on doors to asking about it, but you know, it's it's kind of weird. It's just sometimes we get bristly people. Ah, we got three more from uh, Tony Kanopka, Adam Shepard, and Greg Price. So, uh, we're, and Coffee. those these are just the ones from my author page. Uh, the the others uh, it doesn't tabulate. We're going out to eight different sources. We're on YouTube, Twitch, uh, multiple multiple uh, Facebook groups, and like four Facebook pages. So we're 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 in several places. Very cool. That's awesome. Well, the Facebook yeah. user is uh, Cat Dahman, another author. Uh, Kat, oh yeah, Cat's an awesome author. I've I, she's actually the only person I've ever co-written a book with. Her and I uh, wrote uh, Cold Hunger together. I'm pretty sure we're we're buds on Facebook. Hey, Cat. I love Cat. We got to hang with her a couple of weeks ago, and it was it was yeah. totally fun. We need to get her back on the show. Her her thick Texas drawl cracks me up. So after the show, you need to tell me where I can find the past shows so I can go watch some of those. Uh, like most to. of them are on my uh, YouTube channel, which is okay. uh, Ozark's Haunted Pathways. All right, right. And I've got other videos I've shot at some of the locations from the books and everything. And it's just, just my, my channel for catch all videos, but all, all of the DAX Machina and the nightmare hunter shows go there. Very cool. So, uh, it's pretty awesome. What would you say would be your favorite zombie movie? Zombie movie. You know, I, I, I used to say it was, uh, Romero's, uh, uh Dawn of the Dead. Mm-hmm. But since uh, Zach, uh, is his name Zach, uh, I can't remember his last name. He's, anyways, he the, the 2004 Dawn of the Dead is oh, taken yes. over for me. 
even though the zombies are fast, mm -hmm. I like the production value. I like Ving mm -hmm. Rames. I like the oh, intro. Rames is awesome. As soon as the intro came on with uh, Johnny Cash when the man comes around, I'm like reeled in, and I watch. <laughs> I, I watched it with my buddy at the theater. I talked him into seeing a zombie flip for the first time, and, and he's a high school buddy, and he actually likes zombie stuff. That was pretty cool. When uh, I first Probably. watched that movie, shortly after it first came out, I was watching it with my wife, and I remember my reaction was grabbing her arm and going, "They're not supposed to be fast." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the in, the intro, oh man, wow, crazy. I was wigged out. That's now, a great I, movie. Uh, I had never seen a fast zombie uh, until I saw Twenty Eight Days. That's a good one. And uh, and of course, uh, um, oh, what is the name of the British guy that plays the main role in there? Um, uh, Carlisle, Robert Robert Carlisle. Was his name right? uh, I, think I, I don't so. know. I, I can't recall. Yeah. I thought it was the guy from Peaky it, Blinders. Oh, you're think. Well, he was one of the main characters. I know who you're talking about. You're talking about a mm -hmm. um, yeah, that played Scarecrow on the uh, yeah. On the Dark when he comes across that nest though, and he, he runs from him. Oh, that's a, that sequence just had me going. And just across the field to the to the boat ramp or the dock into the water yeah. on the boat, and they just don't stop coming. <laughs> it was awesome. Well, yeah, the, I, I kind of reacted like you. I was like, it was a fast zombie. I'm like, oh, hell, they're not supposed to do that. And it's like, you know, because in my head, I planned out, you know, I, I've got contingencies for if there's a zombie apocalypse. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. And then when they started running, I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> That's a whole plan. And then like, plan, plan just went out the window. Oh, yeah. like in the new World War Z film, when they shift to zombie form in like seven, eight seconds. And they start running, and they yeah. feel pain. I'm like, oh my god, this is terrifying. That makes it really uh, believable that the, we would fall that quickly. Definitely. Yeah. But I mean, I the the, the book. I love the book, and I, I bought the audio book, which has got a bunch of different narrators, and the audio book is phenomenal. Um, the movie, I just pretend it's like something else, and I'll, I like the movie, but it's not World War Z. Right. It's very no, very it different at all. Book. I mean, I wanted the sub commander story. I wanted the transport pilot survival story. I wanted mm -hmm. to see all that on the screen. The blind monk, the gamer. I wanted all that stuff, but I didn't get any of it. I read a I read an interview yeah. with Max Brooks after they made the movie World War Z, and they interviewed him after he had just come out of a special screening of the movie. They said, uh, "Sir, what did you think of the of the movie?" And he goes, "Well, they <laughs> used my title." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. I thought that yeah, was hilarious. I, I, I ran across a post uh, David Moody posted on a, one of the zombie groups about his, he had, when his book Autumn was made into a movie and he posed the question to the group. Um, my movie came out, whatever it was, and, and people panned it. They said it wasn't a, a good movie. He says, do you think that, it, it, that having a movie put out, if it was not produced to your standards is okay, would you be, accept that? And I wrote to him, I said, uh, man, that's an honor, you know, having your stuff up on the screen. Not very many people get to do that. And right. I put in there, Autumn is one of the few zombie books that I've read twice. You know, there's a few back in the day. I, I don't read zombie fiction now that I'm writing. And it's just one of my strange little rules. Just I don't want to, by osmosis, take someone else's stuff, you know, on accident mm -hmm. or something like that. But it's just, uh, you know, I've read a couple of uh, arcs for people. But other than that, I, I read military thrillers and, and stuff like that pandemic books have you read the book charlie mike i have not that's a great book it was written by the former commandant of the uh airborne school in the 80s oh. it was about his experiences in vietnam great wow. book um i want to say that the the writer's name is elmore leonard i think it is i'd have to look it up not sure but it's a great book and it's it's one of those books i've read like three or four times uh, because it it has moments in it that will really choke you up. It's, right. it's a fantastic. I love military style books. I was a huge Tom Clancy book, Clancy yeah, fan. Me too. When when it was actually Clancy writing them, when someone else took over, they weren't near as good. Yeah, you can tell the difference. And uh, Vince Flynn as well. I'm a big Vince mm -hmm. Flynn fan. Vince Flynn fan. And uh, his his co Ghost Rider, whoever took over after he passed away, is not the same in my opinion. I used but, to. Uh, I used to get made fun of by some of my buddies because I liked the Richard Marchenko Rogue Warrior series. Oh, Dick Marchenko, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those were fun. Red Cell, did you read Red Cell? That was some yeah. good, good nonfiction right there, man. Yeah. He he pissed off a lot of high-ranking people. Yeah, I, I guess he made a career of it. <laughs> yeah, he did. 
he did exactly what he was supposed to do, and then he got almost got what court martialed for, right? Came close. I think putting a three fifty seven to a sub commander's head and taking a photo is kind of over the, over the line, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you can definitely say the guy's character. Uh, guy's character is defined by the phrase "I don't give a crap." Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's gonna do what he's gonna do. But he made the SEAL teams what they are today, right? He's a legend. Yeah. I do love his books. Uh, because of his books, I tried Bombay Sapphire, and I, I just wasn't impressed. <laughs> I was never a gin drinker, never. You know who I uh, really got me inspired was also was Don Pendleton. I I'm a, mm -hmm. I used to read executioner books behind oh, my school so books great. in high school instead of reading the school books, and uh, I pour through those. Did you did you notice after about the twentieth book of the executioner books, it was just a formula? Yeah, yeah, it's but been so long. But the formula works. He'd, he'd get a he'd get a cover and then write the story to the cover. I think. I love it. Great so, covers. FYI, Charlie Mike was written by Leonard B. Scott. Leonard okay. B. Scott. Okay. That way I we knew there the, was a. The, well, hey, we're gonna plug his book. I want to make sure he gets the plug, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, he was he was old school back in the day. Uh, Vietnam long range reconnaissance patrols. He wrote it in 1985. I don't know why Operation Phoenix, I think it was called, wasn't it? Something like that. I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I love books like that. And I, I love old movies like that, too, like uh, Siege of Firebase Gloria. Oh, my God. That was one of Arlie Ermey's early movies. Great oh, movie. Ermey, yeah, I miss him. Yeah, him, definitely. Uh, yeah, Siege, if you haven't seen Siege of Firebase Gloria, you should watch it. Okay. It's okay. it's a it's a classic. The seventies movie, I'm guessing seventies or so. Uh, I want to say it came out eighty two, eighty three, somewhere okay. around in there. Okay. Um, not a hundred percent sure. I'll look for it. Uh, Greg Price says, "Isn't Pendleton a pen name for a bunch of ghostwriters?" Oh, it is now. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But he is the original author way back when. I think. Yeah, kind of like Tom Clancy. Now there's a bunch of different authors writing under under his name. Tom yeah. Clancy's this that. And Patterson, how can the guy put out what twelve books a year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. the guy's a machine. Otherwise, a machine. Just just a, he's just a, he's just a mobile printer. <laughs> <laughs> Interface in the brain and just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I could, if I could plug a cord in, I could write a lot faster. You ever, you ever have like a good scene in your head, and you're you're not around paper or your computer, and then you you have it, and you know you have it, and you sit down to write it, and you're like, I got nothing. I've done that a million times. <laughs> um, I uh, used to keep a notebook next to my next to my bed because I would like come up with these great scene ideas in my head. And I was dreaming one night, and I you know I had this great combat scene that I wanted to do. <laughs> and I woke up, and I I was still half asleep, and I fumbled for my glasses, and I grabbed a pen, and I jotted down some notes real quick, and laid it down, and and uh, I laid down, and went back to sleep. And uh, well, I woke I woke up the next day and I was like, all excited to read the notes to try to bring it back to my head. And it was two sentences. He grabbed the gun and I made coffee. <laughs> You're like, thinking about it. <laughs> that's not helpful. <laughs> so I don't keep a, I don't I don't keep one. Yeah, Siege I wrote of most Firebase Glory was 1989. Oh, it was newer than I thought it was. Oh wow! Wow. Thanks for looking that up, Greg. Right? On my iPhone, on the yellow pad, I, my boy was in indoor. It rains a lot here, so I'm gonna take my boy up to the indoor gym. He'd ride little carts around or play or whatever, and I'd sit up in the stands and I'd write scenes on the yellow pad, email them to myself, oh, wow. go into the email, copy it, paste it into the Word document, and of course, you know that was before we knew that you had to have a certain formatting style. <laughs> and uh, the first time I put it through uh, Carnivore or whatever it's called, uh, something Grinder, uh, Smashwords, it just spit <laughs> it right out and said. Try again, buddy. So, <laughs> wouldn't recommend writing on the notepad. Do you uh, do you publish on uh, KDP Select or do you do Smashwords? No, I've been wide. I just stayed wide. I I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. I, I have readers on all the different, you know, Nook and Kobo, and they, they say, you know, hey, well, when's your book coming out? And I don't kind of don't want to leave them in the lurch. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. I uh, I I do most of my own, well, pretty much all of my own formatting. So I've I've stuck with KDP Select, but I've been looking at branching farther out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 easy. It's Smashwords is very easy. I, I might uh, I might be sending you a few messages like, hey, how does this work? Because mm -hmm. I can I can do KDP. I can do that formatting in my sleep. But right. I was looking at. I downloaded the manual for Smashwords, and I read like the first five pages, and I was more confused than anything. <laughs> It's been a while since I looked at the manual. I have fire and forget now. <clears throat> yeah. 
That's awesome. So how many books oh, do you yeah. have out now? Well, I just, I book 15 in my Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse series, Fury, is is going live here. It's on pre-order and Audible just went, pre-orders went live today. So that's 15 in my first series. Awesome. And I'm, I'm writing book four, so it'll be, it'll be in my 19th book in my Rikers Apocalypse series. It's, it's going to be called The Plea. And um, it's, uh, you know, a few chapters into that. And I, I have fast and slow zombies in my Rikers Apocalypse series. Uh, the fast zombies, they've coined them bolts. And this was before Zombieland 2 came out when one of them exclaimed bolt after Hussein Bolt. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't bite that from anybody. I, I thought that up in my own little head. Not that it's a hard thing to figure out, you know, Hussein Bolt, but. I yeah, added in my own sprinkling of zombies in my Ragnarok series. I started out with your basic, you know, normal George Romero zombies, which I called shamblers. Okay. And then I had sprinters. Uh, and then I threw in one I called crawlers, which were ones that obviously couldn't walk. Yeah. Uh, one I called grabbers, which were ones that were trapped, like you're pinned between cars or under mm -hmm. something that could only grab you. Like and, and then I started introducing other kinds. I had one called a shrieker. Uh, which would alert oh, others shriekers. to your presence. Oh wow! And, and then one called a stalker. Uh, so they're they kind of sentient. Then that they they have little, a little, little bit of thought. little, just a, yeah. just just enough to to be aware. And uh, then I had a tracker. Mm. Uh, the stalkers were the were the worst. Uh, everybody mm. everybody that read about the stalkers either hated them or were absolutely thrilled with them. And then uh, had a, had one that when the when winter set in, they they were covered in ice like armor and were mm. still mobile. Oh wow! Yeah, I had mine slowly when the when the weather changed. They slowly were immobilized, and then the, their their voice, their they couldn't make any more sounds. But when they're thawing out, all of a sudden, I had characters in the middle of a pack of them when they're thawing out, and they started whistling, making these whistling sounds as their things unconstricted. <laughs> Pretty eerie. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be terrifying. Oh, but you know, wow. we have to defy science. Look at that. It's time these, to go. <laughs> these books. We have to defy oh, science oh. times. Otherwise, it'd be so boring. Absolutely. <laughs> See, it, it's it, zombies terrify me. Um, you know, I am a, I'm a registered nurse by trade. And um, so, you know, I, I, I know enough of the anatomy, you know, and everything. And um, what, what always scared me about zombies, uh, not that, you know, things like vampires and other things aren't really cool. But zombies are just right on the fringe of being plausible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you start looking at, like, prion infections, you know, like uh, Crotrodiacus disease and, and uh, mad cow and stuff like that, I'm like, it could just possibly happen, and it's absolutely terrifying. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and when, when DA started throwing in some of his more obscure types, that oh, oh, gave me nightmares for days. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have nightmares over your whistlers at this point without even reading the passage because you know, just ugh. you've got a few books to go to get to that, so <laughs> that's all right. I'll be burning it up. Literally, I finished the book, I immediately went on to Kindle because I, I read everything with a Kindle. My wife has banned me from buying too many more books, I run out of room. Um, she uh, uh, it, it, they gave me it's like for. For sixty dollars and X number of cents, you can buy the next thirteen books. Like, take my money. Dang. And then, uh, then I saw the pre-order for uh, Fury, and I'm like, comes out June fifth. Done. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's so, wild uh, you, oh, is I started this series with the you know premise of uh, virus being let loose in uh, China. <laughs> Wuhan, shocker. You know, the shocker. And uh, it just, it's crazy how it mirrors reality. You know, they seed the United States and use it or lose it. You know, they, they can't contain it in their country. So they see the United States. Um, if you read uh, Drawl is Duncan's story. That's, I think, book, I want to say 10. It's, it's kind of a prequel. It, it shows Duncan getting out of Portland, Oregon. And it, it was the book I wanted. To, it was how I wanted to flesh out Trudge, but didn't have the chops to do. Mm -hmm. And so I really fleshed out the outbreak through Duncan's eyes in uh it's called drawl and that that was pretty fun to write that was that was you know it, it's crazy how once we as as writers get a little better in our trade and our craft we we look at the old work at least i do and i go man i wish i would have done this there and so i got to do some of that through duncan's eyes i'm uh i'm gonna go back to the ragnarok series uh because next year is the 10th anniversary of the release of the first one and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go over all of the manuscripts one once just to give them a, a final polish. Mm -hmm. Release a tenth anniversary edition of the of the ten book run. 
Well, that's a good idea. Pretty cool. I think I'm going to do it on hardback. Oh, nice. Yeah. If I can find a place that can do it affordably. The right. ones I've found so far, I'd be like, 40 bucks for a hardback? That's a little much. Yeah, but I've seen that. I, that's why I've been hesitant to go hardback. I, I just do the you know, paperbacks. I'm super happy with that. And what was it like when you had your first paperback in your hand? Um, DA, wasn't that cool? Oh, yeah. <laughs> unboxing the first box of books I got. Wow. I was I was like a kid, like a kid at Christmas. Like we're, we're lucky. We're, you know, we're writing at the right right period in time because the gatekeepers are gone and, and mm -hmm. basically the readers are the ones who are, are giving us val validity you know they're validating our work and yeah. I, think it's it's awesome. I i will reach for an indie writer any day uh just because i mean you guys are, are talented the only difference between you guys and you know the, the jonathan maybury's and the stephen king's or whatever is because somebody who's out to make a buck didn't approve it yet some business person Mm -hmm. you now it doesn't mean the talent's any worse. It it doesn't, you know, it, it's it's amazing stuff. Thank you. And we don't have anyone telling us that we, we gotta take out a certain excerpt or something like that, you know. Right. Uh, my editor, right. Monique Happy, who I've worked I'm with for <laughs> who is that? Oh, wait, Matt, Matt. Matt Roper, a friend of mine, popped in. <laughs> yeah, I worked with Monique since day one. I actually put the cart before the horse and, and put out a couple of books without having really good editing, and then I got her and through another writer and she's been with me ever since and she's nice. not heavy handed at all. It's good to have a woman's eye too. She, she helps out with some of the stuff that, you know, with the women characters, female characters, but uh, you know, she's, she'll tell me when something's stupid and whatnot, but if I want to keep it, she doesn't fight me, which is right. Good, you know, good I, I, I'm sorry. I like that but, about an editor. I, uh, I had to let an editor go one time because they were convinced they were the writer and uh, would send me pages of, of revisions I needed to make. I'm like, wow. That's not your job. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know. This story doesn't go the way you want it to go. This is my book. Mm -hmm. Like, well, if you want it to sell, I don't give a damn what you think about what or whether or not it's going to sell. I want you to edit. Right. Like, well, this is, this is what you're going to have to do. I'm like, well, then you're fired. <laughs> because I'm not going to change 120 pages to suit you in the story. Not exactly. happening. Exactly. Right. That's why we're independent. <laughs> Uh, says good evening, guys. Not sure who that is, but good evening. Thank you. Yeah, we. Uh, that's that's the beauty of being independent. I don't have to send a manuscript. I don't have to send a synopsis in for them to approve before I start writing. I'm like, this is what I'm doing. Yep. You know, and, and we get to choose our own covers, and we get to you know do do everything. Yeah. I, I like involved that. Like in every product. step of the process. Exactly. The only thing I don't like being an independent author is is the marketing. The marketing is. Not really my thing. I learned how to do some of the things over the years, you know, pretty efficiently and so what works, but still I, I have a hard time going out there. I, yeah, just, I, I still struggle with the marketing. I think that's the bane of pretty much every indie author. And yeah, then some people don't ever understand that that, and I, I know some great writers that have never wrapped their head around the fact that you have to market. You yeah, can't you just put to. the book out and everybody flocks to it. Yeah, and uh, and it's sad because I know I know a couple of really talented writers that do no marketing and therefore make no sales, so, yeah. and it's it's kind of sad. And I've tried to explain that to them, like, oh no, if if, if it's well written, people will come. Eh. Mm. <laughs> They've got to know what's there before they can read it. Yeah. And then you, I mean, you got to break through the the, the face or Amazon algorithm. Yeah, you, you have to oh, get a few, a few re reviews and uh, you know. A, couple of also bots attached to your stuff otherwise you'll obscure be in line of security forever you know yeah you'll 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 be Language forgotten yeah well th there's no no rhyme and reason to amazon's also Adrian. bought either i mean it's kind of kind of arbitrary and fun you know right. uh after i bought his his ragnarok rising series on amazon I got an email and it said you know those who bought ragnarok rising also bought and the first suggested item was a, a whiskey flask, <laughs> and uh, which I thought was hilarious. I thought, yeah, I thought it was funny. And so, uh, you know, it, the Black Bush uh, Bush Bills that I was holding up before the show, uh, you know, that, that features pretty prominently in the story. Is why I happened to drink Black Bush, and I'm like, well, if it's approved by D.A. Roberts, damn it, I'm buying it. And so I bought the flask, and I was showing it to him one day. He thought it was funny, and uh, and in fact, I I used it to uh, to. Uh, fill it up with a, a bottle of a good 15 year scotch to take over his house for a birthday party or something, wasn't it? Yeah, Christmas? last year. Last year, I brought birthday. you your flat, your uh, your decanter, and I was like, hmm, 
So you read Ragnarok Rising and you need a risky task. Okay. <laughs> I should get a Bushmill sponsorship. <laughs> oh, seriously. Between the podcast and your book. Sponsorship. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Not that I don't have enough as it is, but. Yeah. Uh, Greg Price says the field's just too flooded for that idea to fly. I think he's referring to the what we were saying about people that don't mark it. Yeah, so, you, yeah. you pretty much just have to. Uh, and it, it it is it's the bane of pretty much all of our existences because it takes up so much time that you could be spent writing projects. Um, exactly. I'm trying to uh, get around the algorithm on Facebook as much as I can. Uh, I started a, 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 a online team team DA Roberts and asked everybody that join if I post a promo for everybody that joins the page to share it. And it's, it's a meeting with some success with it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it'll catch on a little bit more and more and more people that have joined will share. I've got a, a few, a handful of diehards that share everything and then here and there one or two. But. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm kind of loath to get into the, the minutia of it all. I don't, I don't go and read every single review. I don't, go and obsess over rankings i mean i don't i just don't do that stuff it's i think it goes back to the fact that uh you know i stopped drinking uh 15 years ago and and back when i was drinking and, and gambling and doing all that stuff all the, the minutia just spun me out so now i just kind of take it easy you know <laughs> easy does it if i want to use one of those stupid slogans but anyways it's just it works for me uh, Facebook user, I believe that one was Dream said, just got a bottle of Downmore, fifteen year old, for Monday the twenty fourth. That's going to be uh, be good. Um, need to have marketing guru to make a dent. Yeah, I wish I knew somebody that was a marketing marketing genius. I, I have uh, someone's ear. I get to pick every once in a while. It's Tracy Tufo, Mark Tufo's wife. She's nice, brilliant. She knows what she's doing, and she's always always willing to to offer her two cents, which is kind of nice. I'm hoping uh, I can convince my my youngest son. He was talking to me the other day. He's like, "Dad, I'm thinking about going into marketing." I'm like, "Go for it. Go, mm -hmm. go into marketing. <laughs> Keep it in you, the family. You do that, buddy." <laughs> my daughter Raven, who's on the cover of uh, one of my books, she uh, she does my takedowns for YouTube uh, pirates. They pirate audio books like crazy. There, it's like whack a mole. They pop up, and kill one, and they pop up over here. Yeah. I've yeah, seen that. I've sent out a bunch of cease and desists, and like you said, you you kill one, five more pop up. Is this the cover? That's my daughter Raven. Yeah, we we flew down to uh, Prescott, Arizona, two years ago to the um, Straight Eight uh, Custom Photography Studio, and she took that photo against a green light, a green background, or whatever it's called, a fake background, and then yeah. Jason Swar built all that around behind her. That She's got a little. Really cool. uh, it's a that's a Sig Sauer uh, MPX. It's a three hundred blackout. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a SBR, so it's a federal licensed firearm. So you have mm -hmm. to. With a suppressor and then she's got a dagger that Cade grayson carries in the novels it's a, a gerber mark ii it's a vietnam era uh, gerber's made in portland oregon here so i thought that was kind of appropriate to have i've got a few uh, gerber knives i've got one right here on my shelf it's a pretty nice little knife um yeah she she was all gung-ho about it to, to be on the cover of uh this one and everyone everyone thought that Cade grayson was dead because he wasn't on the cover and <laughs> something in the synopsis is you know she lost her parents and lost doesn't always mean lost. So, right. <laughs> Absolutely. You've got great covers, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Swart does all my stuff. This fellow right here, his name is Buck Doyle. He's a, a de decorated U S Marine Corps. Uh, I think he was a scout sniper. He runs right. follow through, um, follow through consulting. It's in Utah. It's a shooting high altitude shooting camp. And he's been in movies. He just, uh, he, that uh, without remorse movie he was uh michael b jordan's uh, uh what do you call it technical advisor or whatever nice that, that movie that tv that movie was nothing like the tom clancy book but oh absolutely yeah the end though if they do rainbow six i'm pretty much on board if i'll watch oh it. yeah rainbow six is my favorite clancy novel uh -huh. uh, this is my favorite blade it's featured in a couple of my codename wild hunt books it's a uh, scallywag tactical it's called the bounty very nice dang it, it's 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 got a blade for chopping. It's it's well, you can see the uh, edge of it, but it is super thick. Very nice. So so we're heavy duty chopping blade. Uh, this is my my about Gerber. Gerber. That's uh, the dagger. Nice. Go. 
This is another scallywag tactical. It's called the Gunner's Mate. A little smaller and nice. Very nice. Uh, scallywag tactical is my favorite right now for, for blades. They make some awesome blades. Yeah, this laptop I have, the picture is kind of small, so I'm sorry I'm leaning in. but Oh, no problem. Yeah, I found through the Zoom thing, you know, this is terrible to use for this kind of stuff. My, my iPad's really good, but yeah, I couldn't get it to work. Sorry, you guys. It is what it is. Yeah. Technical issues are abound. That's why we try to uh, try to get everybody into the studio as early as we can before yeah. the uh, before the actual go time, because inevitably there's something. Somebody's mic doesn't work, or somebody's headphones don't work. Or... So we always try to try to prepare a little ahead of time, and you know, it gives us a few minutes to kind of break the ice and talk a little bit before we go live. We got it. Got it worked out. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like our green room moments on an actual TV interview, you know. <laughs> Green, like a like a Zoom meeting green room. Yeah, you see the the, the the fellow was driving and he was doing a Zoom meeting as he was driving. You could see his seatbelt that come out every once in a while over the green. <laughs> That's funny. Awesome. Well, you know it's funny. I just bought a new car, uh, my first new car about a month ago, and uh, it's got Apple CarPlay on it, and the Zoom app is on there. And of course, as, as near as I know, the car doesn't have a camera, so I would only be able to see the others. But I was like. Oh yeah, that's not going to cause an accident. Dangerous. I, I took the app off immediately. I wouldn't zoom for my car anyway. But I was like, no, this is just stupid. <laughs> We're not doing that. Well, you know, it might be beneficial to have if you're not doing the if you're not doing video if you're just doing audio to have somebody to talk to on a long trip when you're by yourself. Well, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I can see how that would be, you know, advantageous. Uh, last time we went to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, for vacation, it's 18 hour drive and we're I'm from the Midwest. We just drive. We're like, eh, screw it. It's only 18 hours. We'll, we'll drive. We're not flying. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, the last eight hours of the trip, I was quite literally the only one in the van awake out of the seven of us. And uh, I was like, God, I think somebody wake up and talk to me. I'm getting tired. Your five hour energy drinks like crazy. <laughs> yeah. I'd been power oh, drinking yes. coffee for the last 300 miles. <laughs> Was down yeah, to the last bit of my your, thermos. Got your shoe kicked off, your cold foot on the cold pedal. You know, whatever it takes to stay awake. Well, I've even to this day, I, I swear I don't remember the last hundred miles. I, I was just on autopilot. <laughs> Got caffeine. You reach the point when caffeine doesn't work anymore. You you know you're tired. Oh yeah. Yep. It's shortly after that, a couple more drinks, and you start to be able to taste sound. You know, so it's. Uh, all the senses merge oh, yeah God, yes. tunnel vision yeah. Yeah, you uh, uh, I remember you know, working 12 hour night shifts as a, as a nurse you know I, I, I alternate between drinking really crappy coffee and uh, bang energy drinks and I remember I, I had drank two bangs in about an hour and a half period and uh, you know 300 milligrams of caffeine per and uh, it, I, I just remember, like, like I couldn't even sit still. Everything was just kind of vibrating. And uh, I uh, was joking with my wife when I got home. I'm like, you know, if I drank one more, I'd enter the speed force. You know, because I, I was waiting for that, you know, that that flash moment where the da lightning bolts dancing in the eyes. I was just like, oh yeah, let's not start an IV right now. <laughs> yeah, IV leads are hard to do when you're jiggling, right? Yeah, <laughs> when you can't keep your hands uh, yes. still, and you're telling the patient, hold still. They're like, I'm not moving. <laughs> have you done this before yeah why <laughs> like stay like a uh, uh, gene wilder on uh on uh blazing saddles yes this is the hand i shoot with do you put many uh pop culture references in your books do you do you on occasion i mean i like to throw in the occasional uh the, the running gag in my codename wild hunt books which is a military unit that hunts dangerous monsters mm -hmm. Um, uh, the running gag in that is they all make fun of what I call Starbucks coffee. <laughs> Not good. Not good copy. That's for sure. No. no. Uh, one of the, one of the lieutenants on the team, uh, took a drink and found out it was like some caramel thing and he took a drink of it and they're like, if you drink that stuff, you're going to sprout a man bun. And he's like, <laughs> just checking. I'm not, I'm not drinking it. Yeah, I slag on mini jeans or skinny jeans and man buns a little bit here and there in my books too. 
Yeah. I, I always refer to IPAs as the skinny jeans and uh, skinny jeans and man bun of the beer world. <laughs> I don't like hoppy beers. Yeah, I cut my teeth on all those things being from Portland, Oregon. We were kind of the mecca for microbrews in the 80s. There's a few <clears> around <throat> here, but it's it, it kind of moved this direction. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was my downfall, oh, drinking, drinking all the high alcohol beer, high high content. Seriously, we've uh, we've got a local brewery here in town that uh, uh, does a few uh, barley wines. And uh, I had no idea what a barley wine was until I, I bought a four pack of these. I'm like, why does the beer only come in a four pack? And then you get like, you know, halfway through the second one, you're like, this is some pretty good stuff in a four pack, you know, because it, it's something like 13% alcohol. I'm like, oh, start, yeah. start talking in pirate. <laughs> but yes. Well, they, uh, they, uh, this particular company, uh, their, their barley wine is called Foggy Notion. And uh, the, the label has got a picture of a lighthouse hunter or a lighthouse uh, keeper with a, you know, like a gas powered, you know, lantern. I'm like, yeah, you get two beers in, you feel like that guy. That's you finding the bathroom <laughs> or the closet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steve and I uh, were barbecuing one time. Our wives were up at his apartment and we were down oh. in front uh, barbecuing and we took a big cooler of, uh, of Guinness down there with us and we're barbecuing and laughing and talking and pretty soon I, I knew there was like a case of Guinness in there and I opened it up and I'm like, Hey, where'd the beer go? <laughs> we're like, Oh yeah. no. Cause it'd been like yeah, 45 it, minutes and we just killed it. Yeah. In, in 90 minutes, we destroyed a case of Guinness. And, uh, you know, I live in an apartment and in Springfield, we have, we had an issue several years ago with a lot of apartment fires, you know, idiots would light their grill and go inside and it would catch the place on fire. So it's illegal in Springfield to grill from your deck. Uh, and so there's a little park, I don't know, 25, 30 yards from my apartment, but it's down a hill. And so it's kind of a pain in the ass to carry the cooler of meat and the grill and everything. Cause I've got a little Smokey Joe Weber. And so I drove my car down there. I put all you know, load all the stuff up, and then of course DA comes up, and it's like sixty feet. Start, yeah, yeah, it's it's literally nothing now. So he comes and we're we're you know we're, we're grilling, and the, the the beer's gone. And so, well, the wind didn't want to come down, and the heat, you know, and the bugs, and so they wanted us to you know, bring everything back, and we grilled it, and so we had to drive the car back. And uh, I I lost my best friend to a drunk driver, so like I never get behind the wheel. You know, when I had any alcohol, but you know, we had to move the car to 60 feet because I couldn't keep it parked where it was. And so I looked at DA and uh, I'm like, are you able to drive? He goes, dude, I'm annihilated. I'm like, hmm, okay. So we get in the car. And I'm like, great. I'm getting in the car next to a law enforcement officer. Well, admittedly trashed. And I'm like, okay, we got to drive 60 feet. And I started the car up and I put it in reverse and it moved maybe a couple of feet, but it felt like it moved so fast. And I was like, oh my God, it's moving so fast. And he's laughing. He's he's almost peeing in my seat. He's laughing so hard. And you know, we we get the car moved up. We get into a parking spot safely, and we've got to go up like eighteen stairs. And we're going hand over hand like Batman and Robin from the nineteen sixty show. You know, trying to get up the stairwell. Oh, it was. And of course, our wives both look at us like, "What did you two idiots do?" And I'm like, "Nothing." Where's the cooler? Cooler beer? It's in the car. Why don't you want the beer? It's empty. Yeah, <laughs> we don't need it. It's empty. He can stay out there. Yeah, not smart. Well, you know, it's not the, not the dumbest thing we've ever ever done. <laughs> no, no, that that trip to Joe Bald State Park was probably the dumbest thing we've ever done. That was that was crazy. There's no alcohol involved in that. It was just us going to an abandoned abandoned park in the middle of the night. No, I could abandon like campground conservation park. Yeah, campground. Yeah, Bigfoot hunting or what? Uh, we were going down there to shoot a promo video for my book, The Lakeview Man, and uh, actually ended up catching something on camera that we didn't even know about. Uh, it was like a year later when we when it was found. Um, I'll uh, show you some of the pictures. I think I still got them in here. Yeah. So, well, here I'll, I'll uh, show you a little bit of the video. We it was the bit, video was about two minutes long, and uh, this was this.
Well, with that, I'll uh, bring up a picture. I've got to get up there. If you look into the back, straight back from the, the left-hand rail, mm -hmm. there's a tree, and you can kind of see something kind of sticking out from behind it. Well, we didn't notice that at the time. Right. Uh, we, we shot the video. I uploaded the video to my YouTube channel uh, just, just as a promo for the book, and it's still listed on there as, you know, Joe Bald State Park, Lakeview Man. And uh, we didn't see anything. Uh, so flash forward year, year and a half later, uh, we, we showed the video on, on the, the show, the nightmare hunter. And one of the guys that was, uh, one of the co one of the hosts, uh, from NDB media spotted movement. And we're like, I, I don't see anything. And, uh, so he, um, uh, he said, yeah, he does. So a couple of guys that we know that, that do video editing went in and started taking out uh, stills from the, uh, from the, from the video. And they said, there is something definitely sticking out from behind that tree. Wow. And uh, we actually went, went back out there in the daylight, and there's nothing that it could have been. Uh, went to the exact spot, measured it, and whatever's sticking out is about eight feet off the ground, roughly. Wow. It's well well above the head of a normal, normal sized person. Uh, and then when they started looking at it, you can kind of get a look at it there. But when they cleaned it up, you can you wow. can see Eyes it's a... Mouth. Yeah, it's a dog-like head, and you can see the claws down toward the bottom of that circle. Oh, yeah, grabbing the tree like that. Yeah, so it freaked us out because <laughs> we well, didn't see it they, at the time. When they slowed the uh, – when I, I was actually the cameraman. When mm -hmm. I panned the camera back, it not only is behind the tree, but it pulls its head back behind it. Yeah, it and leans it back behind the tree. And so we, we – uh, one of the uh, – Local people that investigate these, these cryptids, these you know, animals not officially acknowledged by science. Um, there's something called a dog man, which is it's basically it's like a werewolf that's always in a bipedal dog form. form. It doesn't change back to a human. Native American legends have them going back hundreds of years, mm. uh, and there's there's recorded attacks from these creatures that have been basically swept under the rug. Uh, ones run, run, known as the Beast of LBL or the Land Between the Lakes, uh, the Michigan Dog Man. Um, the the beast of Bray Road. There are all, all counts all over the world of bipedal wolf like creatures, mm. and it, it's really bizarre. And we uh, we showed it to the guys from the North American Dogman Project, and they're like, "Yeah, buddy, I think I think you got a legit dogman encounter." So it was, it was kind of cool. And of course, we had no idea. It's cool you know, now. It wasn't yeah. cool when when we first found out about it. I was like, I was only carrying a nine millimeter. <laughs> I don't know that I could have knocked that down. <laughs> Yeah, I did not. Yeah, I was he, not heavily enough armed for that. Yeah, he, uh, you mentioned you know, Glocks in your your books. You know, he and I both carry Glocks. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I carry a, a Glock 27 as a concealed carry gun, and then Dean was in there with a Glock 17. A Glock 17. Had, and and we were just you know walking through there. We weren't planning on needing anything. It's just that you know what is better to to have and don't need than need and don't have, right? Well, and, you know, uh, but uh, since I since I have been in my time in law enforcement, I I check my mail with a Glock on. I've got my my, my Glock twenty six baby Glock on me just about mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah, I bought a nineteen X a couple years ago. I like it because it's got the the bigger grip. You know, it's mm -hmm. for my hands a little bit bigger. I had a nineteen that I, I I've had for twenty years. It's a Gen two, I think it is. Mm -hmm. My oh, dad, gave, my father gave me that, and this nineteen X is really nice. I like it. I put a. a um, Trajicon optic on it. It's nice. So my eyes aren't great, so at the at the range, it, it helps me out a lot. And yeah, I want to I want to put a, a hollow sight on mine. Yeah, it's, um, it's got it's got the little red dot. It doesn't put it out there, but it's you know yeah, a little reticule. Yeah, reticle on the on the deal, and it's uh, off and on, which is pretty pretty easy to do. So yeah, awesome. and yeah I'm, I'm looking into getting one of those for both my, my baby Glock and my and my seventeen. <laughs> Yeah, I got a concealed carry a couple years ago just because Portland's so freaking crazy. It's you guys know about it probably. It's oh, it's terrible. It's lost. I grew up here, and it's not. It's 180 degrees from what it used to be. That's a shame. <laughs> Miller says, "Do you guys think Tom Cruise would try to convert Dogman to Scientology?" <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> he might. <laughs> Wonder how much money they've they've siphoned out of that guy. And I bet you he's a lot, a lot of money. Yeah, that that guy's probably lost more money and forgotten about it than we'll probably ever make in our lifetime. I had a friend, Don Blackburn, when I was in like third, fourth, fifth grade, growing up, and 
maybe a little bit, well, maybe eighth grade to eighth grade. And his mom was into Scientology. This is in the, in the late seventies. And she would disappear for a couple of days at a time. And he was an only child and I was an only child and he didn't have a dad. I had a mom and a stepfather, but we'd go over to his house and his mom wouldn't be home. So he basically lived with us for a lot of time. So her Scientology dragged her away and she'd spend hundreds of bucks worth of money on books. That's what their bracket is. They sell you books and they, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> they have I, I read some of L. Ron Hubbard's books, and frankly, I wasn't impressed. Battlefield Earth sucked. I've never read any of his books. Didn't Travolta star in that movie or something? Yeah, the movie. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even watch I, that. You know, as bad as the book was, the movie was worse. <laughs> it, 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 it really was. Of course, the, the book was like three inches thick, so there's no way they're going to make a movie that's not the length of the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy Jeez, and, yeah. and, and follow that book. But I don't even know why they tried. Was the book kind of like that, the brainwashing stuff or was it that's just a, a it was of fiction? really bad sci-fi. Okay. Just really like a lot of tropes and, and very, very, very two dimensional characters. They, they, they were basically, basically just archetypes. They weren't even really people. Um, and uh, we read it. Uh, several of us that were big sci-fi fans, somebody suggested we read it and then we would all talk about the book, kind of like a book club, but we were just a bunch of idiots in high school. And uh, so I read it because everybody else was. And uh, they were like, what'd you think? I'm like, I think it was a piece of trash. And I probably, you know, read toilet paper labels that were more entertaining. <laughs> I, I took a unit on Russian literature when I was in, in, in college. And, uh, it was it was interesting, um, you know. It, it it was it was it was a good class. It exposed me to Alexander Solhanitsyn, which is who is a great writer. Um, but for one entire unit, we were going to read Crime and Punishment. And I don't know if you've read like technical manuals on how to assemble a vacuum cleaner, but it's about that dry, um, yeah, about that exciting too. And uh, at the end of the unit, it was like twelve weeks we spent on this book. And she said, okay, the final for this is going to be one question. It's an essay question. And she handed out the, the, the sheet. She says, in your own words, I want you to describe the full plot of Crime and Punishment. And it's like six pages of, of, of paper stapled together with the one question on the front. And everybody around me starts scribbling furiously. And I sat there for a couple of minutes and I stared at that page and I just, after spending, you know, 12 weeks making myself read that piece of crap, I wasn't going to spend the next three hours writing about it. So I jotted out a couple of quick sentences and I turned it in and I, I waited to gauge her reaction to see what she would say. And she started laughing. Uh, she doubled over and almost fell out of her chair. Uh, what I wrote was the crime was Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote this book. The punishment was you made me read it. <laughs> you got a name, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, did you read the book? I said, oh, yeah. So she asked me a few questions to see if I knew certain parts of the book, which I answered. She's like, okay, you read it. Never try this again. And she gave me an A. <laughs> I wasn't much in I, I tried to read the classics, and I just I couldn't get into them. I, uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World I enjoyed. Heinlein's mm -hmm. Tunnel in the Sky, or, you know, the science fiction ones, and some of the Steinbeck stuff. But I just, I'm not that kind of There's person. Like I the said, books. I always had the, the executioner book behind the book I was supposed to be reading. So, I uh, I always liked the action books uh, growing up. And uh, I read a lot of the classics because I grew up on a farm and pretty much reading was it. I mean, that's pretty much what you had. So I read read the expected ones. I read, you know, Jack London. I read um, Tom Sawyer. Uh, my, you know, I read a bunch of those because we had them. Uh, I read the Little House on the Prairie books because it was a summertime and I had nothing else to do, uh, well, other than chores, because TV was three channels back in those days, um, and most of it bad. But uh, yeah, I, I read a lot of books that I, I wouldn't go back and read now. But I'm glad I read them because I was exposed to a different, to a lot of different writing styles. Uh, but it did it did branch me out into stuff like Tolkien and. You know, and from there it just kind of went everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like Tolkien. Yeah, sort sort of Shannara series too. It's a, Terry Brooks is a Northwest author. I got into those as well in high school. Mm -hmm. I read those. Uh, Greg Price says, "Would you mind if I asked a professional question about character construction?" John? No, not at all. Greg, Should go ahead. Fire away. Fire, away. fire away, buddy. 
it, it'll take him about 30 seconds to, to hear us and then and postulate the question. Um, but I think I think every book I ever read in my entire life was basically research going into how to write my own. And um, I think the best writers are people that have read a lot of books. Greg says, have any of you written a monster as a protagonist? How do you keep them monstrous, but also relatable, likable to the audience? We'll be taking notes. I have not. I haven't I either. Start. I've never written from the monster monster's point of view. I, I, I did have, in, I think it was Trudge, when in the, the scene at the falls with the toddlers. I had the woman who turned, kind of her thought pattern was just want, need, eat as she's drag, drag, as he and it's a guy i guess and stew he's dragging himself up the path towards where the kids have just gone that's the farthest i've gotten into the mind of one of disease yeah I, I i haven't really written from a monster's point of view either um it's an interesting challenge good luck with it man i i, I don't know what to tell you on that one i read yeah, a yeah. short story a few years ago that was one of those you know zombie uh because you read this read dot 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 and I, I wish I could remember the name of the, of the short story now, but uh, it was written by a British author, and the, 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 the protagonist was a zombie uh, who was relatively recently turned. And, you know, in, in the zombie, we, we always assume that the zombies are mindless, you know, that, that basically all they've got going anymore in their head is, you know, a few parts of the reptilian hindbrain. Well, this one, it was more like a, like a person who's been locked in you know, they they could they were thinking everything, but they couldn't communicate any of it, and they were trying to process. And you know, they're very sentient. And uh, initially, it was kind of funny because it's written from that typical dry British sense of humor, you know, Monty yeah. Python kind of stuff. Uh, but it was terrifying when you boiled it down because I'm like, oh my god, this guy! I mean, can't communicate. And of course, he's walking through the house, essentially eating his loved ones, and you know can't stop himself uh, and so he's you know he's like you know he's he's you know just got his wife and he's making a meal out of her and he's he's going to terms with the the moral dilemma of the you know addiction that took him over and mourning his his wife it was it was really neat uh i'll dig around here if i can find the name the name of the story i'll uh afford it to to greg for a kind of a something to take notes off of almost uh almost like uh he'd go to cannibals anonymous huh <laughs> basically yeah yeah i think it'd be kind of like you know being in a coma and you know you, you're you can think and you can hear things and feel things but you couldn't move or something like that or your state of paralysis that would be like very scary for right. me <clears throat> well, there uh, there's a, a drug that they use in the uh in the operating room uh and we also use in the er sometimes in the case of traumas uh i think it's called succing of calling but uh everybody calls it sucks and uh, sucks paralyzes. Yeah, sucks paralyzes every muscle in the body, including the breathing muscles. But you're still fully conscious and aware. And um, uh, it's yeah, you know, the thought of it being used on somebody for the wrong reasons is absolutely terrifying. Because you know, you, isn't that you, the stuff they call the milk of amnesia? No, that's propofol. Uh, <laughs> propofol is the next is the next drug you get afterwards. Because you don't want to remember getting sucks. Right. And uh, propofol, you know, gives you retrograde amnesia and it takes that memory out. But, uh, yeah, they're not a particularly combative, like, drug out patient that nothing is neutralizing. They'll hit it with sucks and then followed by propofol very quickly. But, yeah, it's a terrifying several seconds until they get the second drug. Been there. I listened to Metallica one earlier today and I just thought to myself that how... Could you imagine being that poor fella? <laughs> that that came to my mind too. That song, yeah, poor bastard. Wasn't that based on a on a movie? Uh, Johnny Get Your Gun, I think. Johnny Get Your Gun, like yeah, yeah. It's funny, like we're the we're we're, we're referencing Metallica, and kids today are like that that old that old metal band. <laughs> I took my kids to see. I took my boy to see Metallica. One of the last shows we saw before the plague hit. Took them oh, to see how it, and then love this I took both my kids to see Kiss here when they came to Portland. That was a awesome. phenomenal show. They still have it. Oh, I, uh, my, I took my uh, my, uh, my middle son. son to see Trans Siberian Orchestra, and he uh, flipped out. He loved it. I bet. Yeah, 
my boys listen to something right now it's all about world war ii and it's kind of like trans-siberian orchestra it's instrumentalist music but it, it he's learning facts about it um, nice they put facts in the music i want to i would pinta pinta something or, i don't know i can't remember what it's called but he, he listened to it on a, on a trip to the beach because there's him and i mm -hmm. during the you know at the end of the, the the covid thing well a few months ago we went to the beach together just him and i and listened to that nice it's not pentatonics you... is it it might be i i don't know exactly i uh there's he had he found it on on um Spotify and he just was playing it through. Well, if you if you happen to think of it, shoot me a message. I'd like to check it out. I will. He's downstairs right now, but I, I don't want to go bug him. Yeah, I get. I understand. But you know, just sometime if you happen to think of it, shoot me a message. Sure. I'd like to yeah. check it out. I love music like that. I, I I'm always looking for good music to listen to when I write. Uh, when I do combat scenes, I tend to do a lot of heavy metal. Um, it'll yeah. be Disturbed or Sabaton or Five Finger Death Punch. Yeah. We got robbed of that concert. We had tickets for Five Finger, and they canceled it. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was yeah, uh, heading home from work the other day, and I was listening to "Down with the Sickness." You know, from Disturbed. yeah, that's a classic. And so uh, that what zombie movie was that? Was that Dawn of the Dead where that song was in it? Yeah, it was done. It was a. I think a, it was. Richard down, Cheeseman like, did it. Did it lounge style. Yes, lounge style. Get up. And that same get movie down too. The in the elevator scene, isn't the Bobby McFerrin's "Don't Worry, Be Happy" playing on the music? I, I think, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah, cool and the guy's like, I, I love this song. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little Easter egg. I love that. I put Easter eggs in my books. You do that too. I do, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I, I do that a lot. Like a, uh, well, it was a scene in in uh, the first uh, first book of the Ragnarok books. Um, they're 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 going out to try to find somebody, and they're passing a church. And one of the zombies coming out of the church is wearing a wedding dress. And the guy that's in the turret on the Humvee starts singing Billy Idol's "White Wedding." White wedding, nice. Yeah, I had an auto, <laughs> auto shop called Grimes Wrecking or something like that. You know, I threw a uh -huh. little nod to. Yep. to I do that. I throw nods to different zombie stuff and different authors, and that's so, awesome. Yeah, I caught that one. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I love doing stuff like that because then you then you wait to see who who catches it. Yeah. Uh, I, when the first series uh, first first release of the books uh, before I signed with the new publisher, um, I had little images, little pictures we'd done for the chapter headings, and each one had a different one. And w for Nathaniel County, the fictitious county where, where it takes, it's actually set here in Springfield, Missouri. But uh, in order to use an elected official's title, you're supposed to get their written permission. Uh, and I didn't want to jump through that hoop, especially considering I worked for the sheriff at the time. And uh, I did, I did I, so I just changed the name of the county. The county is named after Nathaniel Green. So instead of Green County, it became Nathaniel County, uh, which was just an easy switch. Um, but uh, I we made a Nathaniel County logo with a complete with a Latin motto, and nobody ever caught the Latin motto. I was I was a little disappointed because the Latin motto was translated as "Can you outrun your neighbor?" Ah, that's good. That was very. Oh, good. that's amazing. I've got. I've still got the images somewhere. I'd have to hunt them up, but it was from a, from an old edition, and it was it was just an in joke me and me and the the cover artist put together, and uh, thought we'd throw it in there, and we're like, man, this is gonna be funny when people catch that, and then no one ever did. So it was, like, <laughs> it was a little using, sad. Using song lyrics in, in your my first book, I, and then my luckily the editor told me you can't do that, and so we learned ways of, of throwing in referencing lyrics without mm -hmm. doing it. The latest book that I just wrote on Fury, Kate Grayson pulls up home after a mission and and he just lost a man. And mm -hmm. it, it, I think I put it as, um, he sat in the truck for a moment, listening to Bob Marley, convince him everything was gonna be all right. You know, that, that song and without using the lyrics or anything, you know that he's sitting there trying to, yeah, like, how am I gonna tell the people about this? You know, how am I gonna? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we the ways around it. Us indies have to learn the hard way, though, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I like uh, quotes. I always put quotes at the beginning of the chapters, and I've I, I, I remember reading books when I was a kid that did that, and I thought it was really classy, so I decided to do it. And uh, I, I started looking into that, and you can use a quote as long as you cite the source. So, okay. nice. I, so I have always make sure I cite a source. If I find one that says unknown, I'm like, I don't use I don't use the quote because I don't know mm -hmm. how to cite. Don't want to get in trouble. Exactly. And I try to make the quote I, something pertinent to the to that chapter. I like when you do the patent quotes. 
I Pat, love Patton's a great quote. I, I, he's got such such a a, a a plethora of really good quotes. Churchill as well. Mm -hmm. Always Sun Tzu's got something good to throw in there. When uh, when I uh, uh, I used to be a, a manager for a, a call center team in a in a large bank uh, uh, that's you know pretty pretty big in the country, and um, uh, I I had all these little inspirational quotes that I had printed on nice paper and I had framed them and I put them on the walls of my oversized cubicle office that I had. And, uh, you know, Springfield is, is probably the buckle of the Bible belt, uh, here in the Midwest. And, uh, we have the national, uh, or the world headquarters of the Assembly of God church here. We've got a big, uh, link to the Southern Baptist convention and stuff here. And, and I'm, you know, I'm Christian myself. I'm religious. Um, but I, I had this quote, uh, this just meant to be an inspiration. And it said, it was a famous George Bernard Shaw quote that, you know, you look at things that are and ask why. I dream of things that aren't and ask why not. And, uh, you know, I thought that was a great thing. Well, one of my students who happened to be a local Bible colleague or one of my uh, team, team uh, my, uh, my subordinates that was a local Bible, Bible college student said, well, you know, you know, George Bernard Shaw is a famous agnostic. You know, I'm offended by the fact that you put his stuff up here or whatever. You know, you, you know, you're supposed to be a Christian, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know, you're missing the point of the quote, but, you know, I'll play this stupid game. And so I took down the quote, and uh, on this American flag uh, paper, I printed a quote from George S. Patton, and I said, uh, yes, I read the Bible every goddamn day. <laughs> Conversation stopped. We never got, nobody ever brought up my quotes again. And I was like, I'm done. I'm yeah. done playing this game. You know, I was trying to motivate you. You know, uh, it would be like posting something from Lovecraft. You know, Lovecraft was an atheist, and he was a tremendous racist. It, it doesn't discount his writing ability. I don't like the man. I, I, I you know, he made some neat writing, but he's a racist POS. But you know, he still wrote some neat things. You know, yeah. I, I've never read it, but I'm sure there's probably some neat things in Mein Kampf if you read it. I certainly not to support it, but you know, just because something's a piece of literature that you don't agree with doesn't mean you need to burn it. Yeah, you know? I mean, Andrew I mean, Damon. I, that. I introduced Damon in uh, book two. I think I don't know if you've met Damon yet, but African American uh, character, uh, dreadlocks, and he, him and Cade meet, and it's not the best of meetings. And after that book, I had a. Uh, a reader tell me that I don't know anything about black people. I don't know how to write black people. And I said, well, he's a friend of mine and he's a skier and he can do 360 jumps and he, he's a, a fire BLM firefighter in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I know the guy and that's why I put him in my books because he's a real character. And, you know, the conversation, it, it kind of turned the reader around. The reader's like, oh, okay. You know, I don't, I don't talk to readers anymore, but this is early on. And, um, you know, I, I, my stepfather, I mean, my father was married to a black lady for 10 years. And I spent uh, a decade visiting East Kansas City, Missouri in my teens. And I got along with everybody there, um, you know, played basketball with the kids. And it, it was, you know, it was a black neighborhood and I was to stand out. Uh, it was funny. I came home from the first time I went there the first summer. I almost got heat stroke because I'm not used to Missouri weather. And I went to it's June. The humidity that will get you. Oh, my God. The fire bugs. And the, <laughs> but I said to June, my stepmom, I said, oh, yeah. This, she goes, how would how it go? I go, oh, pretty good. But this kid called me a biscuit. And she's like, a oh, biscuit? No. What do you mean? I got it wrong. Call me a cracker. But, you know, I didn't know what it was. And I'm Close enough. I'm sitting northwest. And they laughed their asses off because I said biscuit. But you know what? I, I got along with everybody. And, and, you know, I write what I know. And I don't, you know, I make up things, certain things. But I, I, characters, I try to keep them what I know. And I don't know. Yeah. Just like, you know, I'm not a racist. I'm not anywhere close to it. And that's crazy having a reader call me out on someone that I knew yeah. I based a character on. Yeah. I am. Uh, well, it's like. Go ahead, Steve. It's like it's like when somebody uh, you know comes in and they and they're a person of color. Like we don't know what it's like to be a black man. No, I don't. I mean, I I you know I got my DNA back, and I I am so white it's embarrassing. Yeah. But but that doesn't mean that I can't appreciate your culture. It doesn't mean yeah. that that you know you don't have a uh, that you're not a beautiful person with a beautiful heritage that needs to be celebrated. You know, <laughs> it's just. Yeah. Golden rule is what I live by, you know, conscious of the character, not the color of the skin. And rule 62 is something I also really subscribe to is uh, subscribe to is don't take yourself too goddamn seriously. Exactly. Works for me. 
Now, if I can't laugh at myself, <laughs> who can I laugh at? Exactly. Uh, when, I, when I create characters, I, I don't create characters based on any specific group. I just create people. Yeah. And the uh, only time I ever describe them deeply physically is if it's important to the character. The rest of the time, it could be anybody. Right. Uh, and I do that on purpose uh, because I want anybody to be able to see themselves in, in some of these roles. And it, it's just, it surprised some people. Like when we, I, I used to do a thing on my uh, author page and I needed to get back to it uh, where I would pick, pick actors and actresses, fantasy casting some mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the characters from the books. And uh, I picked Idris Elba for a character and they were like, really? I'm like, yeah, you totally pull it off. He'd be awesome at it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, so I just, I just create characters. Uh, my experience, you know, from almost two decades in, in law enforcement in one capacity or another uh, has taught me that there are two kinds of people in this world. There's good people and there are bad people. Yeah. And yeah. that's pretty much just how I look at it. You fall into one of the two categories. The rest is just minutia. Mm -hmm. I agree. Unfortunately, as a corrections officer, I dealt with most of the the latter instead of the former. Yeah. But but uh, it was it was still a learning experience. So, in your professional experience, Epstein did not kill himself. No, he did not. I can tell you for a fact just how closely we watch people on suicide watch. There's never a time when they're left alone and the camera quits. It just does yeah, not happen, and not more than one camera. And right. <laughs> And you've got officers doing rounds every few minutes, coming up and checking, make sure they're all right. It, it just it if they if if they even try, we're we're on them before they get it and pull it off. I can't tell you the number of people I've helped cut down. Oh man, I've held pressure on a guy's throat after he broke open a razor blade and cut it open. I held pressure on a guy's arm who laid it open from wrist to. Elbow did the long way, the right way. He did the long way, and we got pressure on it, and he lived. Um, ironically, the guy that cut himself in the throat, uh, when he came back from the hospital, he had staples in his neck, and uh, he took a swing at me, and I pepper sprayed him in the neck. Oh, oh. I'm pretty sure he still hates me to this day. Well, technically, uh, I was aiming for his face, but he jumped back, and I got right across the neck. Uh, I wasn't intending uh, to that, but it it sure looked like it on video. My lieutenant's like, oh, yeah, yeah, don't don't do that. <laughs> this man, yeah, hey, just just don't. Do that. It wasn't <laughs> intentional, sir. I know, but it just looks really bad. Don't do that. <laughs> just don't do that. That's funny. But you know, all of that experience is like you said, write what you know. It it colored it colored how I viewed the world. It colored how I perceived people. I, you know, I see people in good and bad. I don't see I don't see anything else. I mean, yeah. I've got friends that from every cultural background. And I don't I don't say he's my ex, you know, friend, you know, whatever criteria friend, I just yeah. refer to them as my friend. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of cases, I refer to them as brothers and sisters because, you know, we've shed blood together. We've, we've bled together. And that that's a bond closer than, than just about anything you can make. And there are still people that I would lay my life down for and would do the same for me. And, you know, whatever backgrounds we're from be damned because we, we waited through the trenches together. And, um, so I just, my worldview is, uh, it's maybe a little black and white, so to speak, no pun intended, uh, but I just, I see good people and bad people. And you fall into one of those two categories by your own choices, not by how you were born. Exactly. I uh, I really enjoyed, you know, to kind of swing back to, to your, your book, Sean, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed how you, you wrote your, your... Steve, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, are you getting me now? Uh, a little staticky. Hmm, I wonder what's going on. Maybe it's glitching for a minute. I'm clear here, but uh, I, I really enjoy how you write some of your fight scenes and stuff in the military perspective. So you served yourself, right? No, I have not. And I've been asked not, that a okay. billion times. No. Oh, see, I thought you had because it, it's, I mean, your your dialogue and everything is, is spot on. You've got the lingo was, down. I, I think oh, part yeah. of it's you know reading reading some some of that stuff you know Brad Thor Vince Flynn Clancy Don Pendleton my 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 father served in the Air Force so I know some of it from his side and 
he was uh, gotcha. active during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and actually, wow. his he 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 was a uh, in a base in California and working. He was an electronics uh, radio operator guy, and when the first computers came out, he was also doing those big, huge rooms full of computers. And the old ENIAC the, systems. During the missile crisis, he was a go between between some of the generals and the, the White House and patching things back and forth, making sure that the the system stayed up. Which was, you know, he told me that story. I was like, wow. That was in part of part of the history. Pretty wild. I've got a friend. Well, I, just, I, I won't say his name because I didn't ask permission, but he's retired Air Force and he worked in the White House and at one point was part of the team that carried the nuclear football. Wow. Yeah, he, he had some pretty high end clearances. Yeah, my dad was at a SAC base, so the B 52s were spooled up and ready to go. And the, the ready alert aircraft. Pretty high times. Yeah, pretty high alert times. That's pretty cool. Well, I, I, where I was going with that is I just I love the practicality which you wrote it. Uh, you know, I one of the reasons I love reading DA stuff is because of his, his fight scenes. Well, since his characters are normally going up against things that are more than human, you know, they're they're cryptids, they're 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 ridiculously large and muscled and everything. His guys always carry you know the latest heaviest that the military's got to offer. You know, they. they yeah, the, the big ass fantasy guns, you know, these guys get well. And I'm constantly you know, researching new gun technology. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they they've got a black a black budget uh, that that allows them to have some really nice toys. Uh, but you know, your guy Cade, you know, I, I I was very interested in his when he went to bug out to go leave his house to find his family. You know what he happened to take with him. You know, this guy had a full gun safe, but you know the choices he made, the weapons he took. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then, you know, knowing a little bit, bit about the performance of some of these weapons, you know, that, that 338 Lapua that your uh, your guy carries, you know, the ballistics is pretty accurate. You know, he, he knew what it could penetrate, what it couldn't. And, and you know, it, it, was, it was a neat military guy thinking man's process. You know, we'd love to take the whole damn gun safe with us, but we can't. <laughs> no you know, doubt. What must we have, you know? And uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I just yeah. assumed it was from your own experience. No, no, I, I have utmost respect. I put everyone that served on a pedestal, man. Yeah, I took the ASFABs, scored really high, wanted to fly helicopters. Of course, there's no guarantees. <laughs> you have to become a warrant officer, go to school, go to boot camp, you know, basic training. And at the time, you know, like I said, I was too involved in, in the DRINK, so I didn't follow through. Didn't follow through, but... uh. Yeah, I, it's it's funny. My uh, series is set in 20, 2011. I, I wrote it in 2010, 2011, 2012. So between book one and 15, only a year or two has passed, not very long. And so the, I'm hamstrung with my technology. So I've had them raid DARPA a couple of times. Nice. So get to get the full color NVGs and a couple drone technology and a couple of the, the screamers that they employ in some of the later books, you know, to little balls that are, that are, have a human, recording of a woman dying a real recording digitized and it, it draws the disease to one spot you know they use those on occasion so i've had to do that but you know be creative it's like <laughs> a zombie version of the cry baby from from firefly cry baby i've never cry. seen firefly i've heard you've a lot about firefly? it but oh no never God. seen it is it's it fantastic sci-fi or is either it? Is it sci-fi or what? It's sci-fi. sci-fi? Uh, yeah. It's it, it's it only lasted one season. You'll, you'd have to find it like streaming or find oh. the DVDs, but it is totally worth it. Okay. It was uh, it was a Joss Whedon series. The chemistry between the characters was just dead on, and it had such good characters. I mean, it had like had a um, Adam Baldwin in it. Um, mm-hmm. Had um, Nathan Fillion. Nathan Fillion. Uh, Alan Tudyk. Uh, the, the 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 characters were just so good together, and it was it was a there was humor in it, but it was also gritty, and it was like a space western. It really was, but it, okay. it was just really good. And uh, they uh, in the opening episode, uh, they were pulling a uh, illegal salvage operation, and one of the uh, government ships was coming their way, and he said, ah, "He said hit the cry baby," and it was basically a buoy they left way out in deep space that would that would Im- imitate the distress call of a freight of a, of a passenger ship wow. and uh, the, the the main character one of the the, the pilot uh, his name is wash he goes cry baby cry make your mama sigh and nice. fires it up and the, the ship goes off to you know, to you know instead of dealing with salvage they think they've got 
you know, a, a freight line, a, a, a passenger ship in trouble. So like, all right, we'll mark these guys and come back. But so that's how they saved their ass. But yeah, you know, it's just like a zombie version of the crybaby to draw them in. I think that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. One season. Oh, that's too bad. I yeah, it was that. great. I don't know why it didn't last longer. Hmm. Apparently there was some I got some it on just between, between Joss Whedon and Fox. Well, with the stuff that's coming about Joss Whedon, apparently the guy's a phenomenal dick. So, yeah, I've heard you know, I, I'm not, I'm not doubting that at this point. But in, in, in like, a, you know, like you'd reference with HP Lovecraft, you know, you can't deny the guy's ability. I mean, no, some of the stuff, all. some of the stuff he's done, he's, he's got a, he's got a great vision and ability. He's just an ass. I mean, Alfred Hitchcock was an asshole. But, well, yeah, you, you brought, you brought up, uh, you brought up the Little House on the Prairie books earlier, and so those are getting canceled now because they're not to today's standards. And I just you got to draw a line somewhere that you got to separate some of the things those people did way back when were yeah. said their vernacular or whatever with today. Because if you didn't, we did we'd have no libraries. Their libraries right. would have nothing in them. You can't look at history through the lens of modern values, exactly, because they didn't live like we live. Hey, and you can't judge them based on that. The best thing you can do is is learn from it to yeah. say, this is where we are. Look how far we came. Not say, oh, we can't ever talk about this because this was a bad part of, of, of history. Mm-hmm. If you know the old, the, there's the old uh, adage, you know, if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. But the yeah. corollary to that is, is those of us who do study history are doomed to watch the morons repeat it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. No. no kidding. Well, you know, it's it's funny. Somebody, uh, you know, I'm uh, one of my my friends is is kind of a um, almost a tinfoil hat wearing kind of individual, you know. And uh, he, he was comparing the uh, what's going on with the cancel culture and uh, the book burnings with the Nazis in the late 1930s. And initially, I was like, "Oh, you're blowing this out of proportion." And then the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, "You're not too far off what we're trying to do." You know, it's it's yeah. it's sad. Yeah. It's sad. Unfortunately, uh, they'll the 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 pitchforks and, t- and torches come out anytime anybody has a slightly different opinion. So I yeah. tend to get my political opinions to myself. Yep, uh, feelings aren't facts. Got to remember that. That that is a very true fact. Uh, we picked up a few more uh, from uh, likes Ooh. and loves. Uh, Tyler Marshall, uh, deputy. He's a deputy I served with. He's he gave us a love, and Elizabeth Ann Martinez, John Miller, and Roger Jutris all popped in. So did Matt Roper. Uh, thank you all. Slanjama. Drawing them out of the woodwork, Sean. Uh, well, we're, hey, we're, uh, we don't have a huge following, but we have a loyal one. Hey, uh, I meant to mention earlier. Congratulations on your sobriety, my friend. Oh, yeah, that's you know, that's a that's a huge deal. Um, you know, I uh, uh, DNA and I joke all the time. You know, I, uh, DNA wise, you know, I am a an Irish German Catholic. So you know, my blood type is eighty proof. And um, <laughs> you know, when I was in nursing school, I was going through a divorce, and people who've been through nursing school talk about you know what a horrible experience it is anyway. So you know, I was pretty much a high functioning alcoholic, and I took the approach of. I still want to be able to have alcohol periodically because I don't want it to win. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a tightrope you have to walk sometimes. And, and sometimes yeah. stupid things happen, like barbecuing with DA. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the rare the occasions. Most, for the most part, I discovered that my solution was to just have a, a very expensive taste in alcohol. I can't afford to get in too much trouble. Uh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Our, our quote is uh, that he and I have a Valley Park taste and a trailer park budget. And so, you know, I can't tell you how many plot lines from my books have been fought up at his his dining room table over a few drinks. Uh-huh. I'd sit down there and start taking notes. We'll just start firing ideas back and forth. So, I've got a couple of good friends that that I bounce ideas off of, and a couple of people that are like every time they run across new military tech, they're like, "Hey, Doug, check this out." <laughs> so I, I'm always always getting the getting the cool stuff. Yeah. I've been kicking around yeah. the idea. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, John. I've been kicking around the idea of writing a Western. I've been reading some Louis L'Amour recently and uh, oh, some kind of, I don't know, demons or something in, in the West. It, mm-hmm. There's a new Madrid fault. There was a huge earthquake back in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And that's not far from where I live. That's just San Boyles a few hours. 
the rivers were running backwards and riverboat captains were talking about their paddle boats going backwards and but yeah, I can think of a fisher opening up and letting something out and maybe think about transporting my, my main character back there, you know, and have him be a, I don't know, a veteran or a lawman or something, or even a wrestler. I don't know. Maybe I'll write a bad guy for a change. Kind of neat. That would be kind of fun. Well, the, uh, the, the bad guy who has to look. be the good guy in this situation, even though he doesn't want to be. Or an anti-hero or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Something like that. Well, the town of New Madrid, Missouri, was about an hour from where I grew up. And uh, the original town of New Madrid is under the Mississippi River now. Yeah, they said uh, it shifted. Yep, it ran backwards for several hours, uh, like literally flowed north. And then when it flowed back south, it dug a new channel. And so divers will go down sometimes, those old houses and stuff from down there. Uh, but it was it was phenomenal. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, on the subject of westerns, uh, Jonathan Mayberry a few years ago, wrote a Western that was based off of the Deadlands uh, RPG. Uh, mm. And um, that was actually really cool. I, I, I didn't know anything about the Deadlands uh, role-playing game. I, I was a, you know, I played it I cut my teeth on, yeah, I cut my teeth on D&D third edition. So, you know, I, I didn't know this, uh, but uh, uh, it, it was really neat. And, and the, there's a, an item in there, world this this i think they call it ghost rock it's some kind of an ore that holds some kind of a uh like a radioactive power but that it's also got almost like a spirit world power and so everything has this really weird kind of steampunk mystical kind of a feel to it and it was a hell of a good read and um a couple other uh, they ended up writing the book as a trilogy and uh, Jonathan wrote uh, one, and then I forgot big other big name horror writers wrote the other two, and so you have three, three different people writing a different book, shared universe, mm-hmm. and it was amazing. Uh, I really really enjoyed it, and um, you know seeing like the weapons they made with like you know guns that had ghost rock bullets and the weird uh-huh. crap that they were doing, it was it was neat. It was very neat. I haven't read those. I need, might need to check those out. I played that game years ago in college. It was pretty cool. Dabble a little D and D myself, but that'd be also kind of fun to, to write a fantasy book or two. I uh my uh my code name Wild Hunt group is uh, is about a military unit, special forces unit, like I said, that hunts monsters, and I've credited credited a history of the team going back, you know, decades. Uh, talking about how you know there was a team that was formed right after Vietnam and had issues, and then talking about the history during during World War II, uh, like the U.S. government's been aware of these creatures for a long time, but they've mm-hmm. gotten only sl- steadily better at fighting them. Uh, I want I would like to do one uh, set with like a like a renegade group of Bigfoot that attack um, a, a civil war battle because of the noise, because a oh, lot of yeah. noise is said to draw draw them in, and survivors of both. North and South have to band together to to stop them. And mm-hmm. I thought about doing something like that. I think it'd be a lot of fun trying to have a monster monster hunting group with ramrod technology and the old the old uh, yeah. get the Green Mountain Boys out hunting them. Exactly. <laughs> I think it'd be a fu- be a, lo- a lot of fun to write. I took uh, inspiration from the Green Mountain Boys book before last. I introduced a new character. He's a Pacific Northwest retired. His name is uh, Remember Baker, named after a, a Remember uh, Green Mountain Boy back mm-hmm. in the day. And uh, his nickname is Alamo, of course, you know, Remember Alamo Baker. Right. And he, he heads a, a ragtag team of, uh, of people fighting back because the CCP is invaded. I'm, I'm ruining the book series now for, for Steven because he's going to read them oh. through them. But So that's oh. the, the, the zombies aren't the only thing they're fighting now because they've been invaded. And, and remember, and he 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 calls his group the Wolverines, you know, because nice, uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's uh, awesome. nice homage there. Up a nod to them, you know. It's in Pacific Northwest, and it's pretty fun. That's I love being able to to write all that kind of stuff, not have to worry about an editor telling me I can't. That's the right. best part. You know, if I decide oh, I want to write whatever, I write it. Yeah, the opening scene. Never... The opening scene to Fury has has 
remember and his team popping an ambush on the CCP uh, 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 patrol and they're in the, the Queen Anne district of Seattle and you got the Space Needle in the distance and remember just got done watching the CCP soldiers on the Space Needle railing hanging a, a, a red flag, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party flag. And he's like motherfuckers mm -hmm. on Independence Day, <laughs> the nerve. And then so so he gets a, they, they take a couple of the, the guys hostage from the, the, the patrol and they're interrogating one of them up in the upstairs room of this uh, house and he's, he looks at his watch and it's almost noon and down down in Elliott Bay there's a whole bunch of Chinese warships it's their cobbled together fleet and it's the invasion force and he goes take a look at this and the rods from God come in and decimates the the fleet as as he's watching as the team is watching you know just boom 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 that's awesome that was a fun scene to write <laughs> i'm not gonna read was. that i want to want to read that scene and listening to adam paul perform it i just got in proof listening to the audiobook and this guy is phenomenal i i'm not a huge audiobook fan but now i am after having him produce for myself you know my series <clears throat> i uh i i don't uh typically do audiobooks uh, just because uh, when, when I get in, uh, one of the worst things you could do for me, and yet one of the best, is to make a movie about a book I love. Because I have you know, my way of picturing the character, what they're going to look like, what they're going to sound like. They have very specific voices. And, of course, the Hollywood director, the casting director, never gets the right person. You know, And uh, I remember, like, you know, everybody loves the Harry Potter books. You know? I I was at a had finished I think the first four or five books when the first film came out, and I was like, "That's what he sounds like. That's what he looks like." You know, it's like it, yeah, it, it, like little things would aggravate you. Like in the books, you know, Harry Potter has green eyes. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe doesn't, right. and they didn't do anything about it. They, they didn't. I'm like, with all the CGI technology, could he at least made his eyes the right freaking color? You know, as, or or, or contacts. Well, yeah, it's 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 just you know, stupid. Shit. It's like, like I'm, I've been reading Lee, Lee Child Jack Reacher books since I was young, since they first came out. My stepfather introduced me to him, and so you know he's he's six four two two forty. He's blonde in the books. However, and we cast Tom Cruise. However, I'm gonna. This is gonna be an unpopular opinion amongst the you guys. I'm pretty sure is that when I watched the first Reacher movie, the second one wasn't great. Tom Cruise pulled off the mannerisms, in my opinion, of Reacher. The the mannerisms, I, 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 I the syntax. He He's a he's a shrimp, but he pulled off the fight scenes, the syntax, the mannerism, in my opinion. And I'm not a Tom Cruise fan. I'm, oh, not, I'm not either, but he did a surprisingly good job. I understand he campaigned hard to get that role too. I think he bought the. I have heard that he bought the rights to a lot of the movies, but I may be wrong. I, yeah. I, I read it myself, but that was a in passing rumor I heard. But, wouldn't surprise me. A phenomenal actor, like him or not, he's a phenomenal yeah. actor. I'm and, uh, Well, yeah. Has, to see the new Top well, Gun, oh, can't wait! Well, it's like uh, I love when, the first one. What you were like when the vampire uh, interview the vampire came out? You know, he's playing Lestat. You know, Lestat was six foot three, mm. and you know, six foot three, violet colored eyes. I mean, he had a very distinctive look. Tom Cruise wasn't it. <laughs> you know, no. he yeah. did a good job in the role, but he was not it. <laughs> What's that say, Bigfoot? Human Apparently, war. there was a Bigfoot human war. Huh. Greg, could you send me that in my my Facebook Messenger so I can click on it? I can't click on it on here in the chat. Uh, well, there's, I, there's I, I a, definitely want to look at that. There's a, a story of the miners, or I think they were miners. Up Big in Canyon. The Northwest, and, and they were in a, the, the cabin, mm -hmm. and the Bigfoot threw rocks down on the cabin. Mm -hmm. That was up in the, up in the Gifford Pinchot, pretty close to us. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot of accounts of Bigfoot activity coming from up your direction. Do you have any uh, any Bigfoot well, yeah, stories? My, my my grandfather, my mother's father, um, he was a logger in the Pacific Northwest for decades. And in the and my mom was born in '41, and he was doing it back in '41, so probably the '40s and the '50s until he got too beat up to to do it because he was he died in the '80s, and I was a teenager, and he was really hunched over and pretty pretty bad off physically. Logging is a rough job. It, it's it's a tough, tough on the body. Job. And there's pictures of him standing on, I don't know what they call it. There's a, a big plank they put in the tree that the dudes stand on and they, you know, their old equipment, they didn't have 
the stuff we have now and the trees were a lot bigger back then so anyways he he, he would always tease me as a kid because we'd go up there and stay up in the, the gorge you know and and he'd tease me about bigfoot you know and had me thinking he was joking when i got older he told me that him and the, the crews would find things moved things that couldn't be moved that were big they'd hear stuff that was just not you know he, he knew all the wildlife out there they'd hear stuff that was just not so I'm a believer. I believe that he, him and his guys, he never said he saw one, which, yeah. you know, in my opinion, I think if Bigfoot is as smart as they, as they say he is or she or whatever, that it's not going to want to be around humans. It wants to be as far away from us as possible. And I think exactly. the encounters are just happenstance, you know? Yeah. Well, the encounter stories go back to before, before European settlers were here. I mean, Native American lore yeah. dates back centuries. And Sasquatch, that was their name in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Well, oh. every tribe, even tribes that didn't con didn't have connections, described the same creature. And there's 40 different names and 40 different tribes for Bigfoot. Right. Yeah. There are no coincidences, right? Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. Well, and my argument of the whole thing is, you know, I don't really look at like a hoop supernatural connection to things. But, okay, let's assume that, that Bigfoot is some kind of a... a you know, uh, divergent evolution thing. You know, we share a common ancestor in two different directions. You know, it's safe to assume it's probably got near human intelligence, if not human intelligence. Okay, think about like a special forces sniper. You know, you know Uncle Sam's greatest in a ghillie suit. If he doesn't want to be seen, he's not going to be seen. There's not going to be a trail. You know, there, there's been many, many stories of people walking right up on snipers and practically mm -hmm. stepping on them. Mm -hmm. It's like sniper school. You know, they, they, they have to creep up to the spotter. And if the spotter yeah. thinks that he sees the sniper, he has to go out and have, have someone go out and place, I think it is a, a flag or something near where he thinks the sniper is. And oftentimes, nope. no, the sniper is not there. So, yeah, you're right. It's nope. if you don't want to be seen. And yeah. and those are guys who have been trained to do it. Imagine being an intelligent creature that was born to it. Yeah, yeah. Survival instincts too, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, they will be the masters of camouflage. Uh, they they know the, the, the every square inch of the woods like you know your own living room. Mm -hmm. they, um, they're not going to be found if they don't want to be found. And most of the sightings are those random encounters where somebody rounds a corner in a trail and there's one that's like, oh. Yeah. Oh crap! <laughs> Time to go. Yeah, yeah. But there are the <laughs> like the, uh, the strange accounts of uh, people that have been attacked. Uh, Native Americans used to used to claim that Sasquatch would come into into their camps and carry off women or women or or even sometimes men. Wow. Um, some tribes referred to them as uh, as cannibals, cannibal tribes. Um, there's a type of Bigfoot referred to as the Gugway, which is extremely aggressive. Uh, it's, 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 it's a meat eater. It's a predator. Mm. And, uh, the, the native American accounts that talk about that say it would literally carry people off to eat. Uh, in fact, the name Gugway means face eater. Oh, wow. uh, so there's a, there's a lot of different, different accounts. And sometimes they describe similar, but very different types of creatures. So you're saying it's, 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 like it's a fascinating the subject. There, huh? Yeah. <laughs> not a, a benevolent creature right I, I would say some encounters i mean you know look like for example if you're hiking up in the woods and you round a corner and you run into a grizzly bear mm. uh, grizzly bear depending on its mood or whether or not it's hungry it might grunt at you and walk away or it might maul you to death um i think it doesn't I, have cubs nearby Right, exactly. I'd say it depends on the circumstances because I've seen black bears up close, and they every time I've ever had an encounter, I'm not saying this would happen every time, uh, but you know, round a corner and see a black bear, and nine times out of ten, it just shags ass and gets out of there. It doesn't want anything to do with you. I would say it'd probably be the same kind of encounters like that, but you cross one on the wrong time, it's hungry, you know, it hasn't been able to, you know, it's getting older and it can't catch prey anymore. You might look like an easy meal. Yeah. Well, I uh, came across a, a, a den of badgers uh, when I was down at one of the scout ranches that I used to camp at. And I, I came around a corner. Uh, we were coming back from the lake. We were fishing or screwing around with the turtles or something that was in the lake. Come around the corner, you know, a female badger outside her den. Apparently, the den had some cubs in it. And uh, let's just say that I de asked that situation post haste. <laughs> and 
And, uh, you know, they're 30, 40 pounds, but I was convinced I was going to get torn apart. You know? They'll do a number on you. Uh, Robert Miller says probably closer to their territory. They may be more prevalent and aggressive. Yeah, the, a lot of the a lot of the research I've done indicates that sometimes they'll find tree structures in the woods, and sometimes there's an X pattern, and sometimes they get they like lump them together like a dome, and those have got to be some kind of territorial markings. And I would say if you encroach, encroach into the wrong territory, you might not come back out of it again. I mean, look at the Alaskan okay. Triangle. How many people go missing in the Alaskan Triangle every year? I don't know. It's a lot. I, I don't know about that. Yeah, per capita, it's there are more missing people in that that triangle in Alaska than anywhere else in the world. Wow, is it people that you think could just go out to hunt or something and get some lost of them? Or get some or? of them are armed hunters, people that have yeah. hunted there their whole lives. Uh, there's a number of aircraft that crashed in that area that were never found. Uh, because the, the, the hell the aircraft that crashed, I think there's more than a dozen aircraft, including a DC-10 that went down in the Pacific Northwest that they've never been able to find because of the dense forests. Wow. Um, you know, some of these places, just because they are so densely forested and heavily forested, you know, you, you could lose a person in there and never, never find a sign of them. And I think a lot of that's what happened. Some of them, I'm sure some of them are bears uh, because, you know, bears are very aggressive, especially in Alaska when they're, when they're competing from, for food sources. I mean, if you've got a grizzly bear, it's taking down moose. It's not going to have too much trouble taking down a person. Right. Um, but, you know, situations oh. like that, I'm sure a lot of it's, it's, it's animal predation, but there's a lot of, of uh, sightings of Bigfoot in Alaska or the, what they call it, the hairy man. Um, but there's a town in Alaska that was, that was abandoned because of Bigfoot attacks, Port Chatham, Alaska. It was abandoned in the 1950s and it was a fun, it was a, a, a busy, uh, cannery. They mm -hmm. caught fish, brought it into the cannery and, and sold them all over the place. And they almost overnight, they abandoned that town because people would go out to hunt and they would find arms and legs. And sometimes they would find torsos. Uh, and sometimes they just disappeared. And there are other people that would say at night, a large hairy figure tried to get in their house and it wasn't a bear. Crazy. And uh, so they, they abandoned an entire town over it. Uh, so I, I, I'd say there's something there. Definitely. Uh, Robert's just big thicket in East Texas. There's a lot of sightings down there and, and they tend to be more aggressive. Uh, that's, that's some pretty dense territory. Well, I want to take a trip down to the Wachita mountains here, just in, Northwest Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, you know, my friend Brian, you know, I grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, right at the northern edge of the Wachita's. And uh, he's like, yeah, there's, you know, it's like, there's parts of it that look like the badlands of the Dakotas, <laughs> you know, just remote. I've got a, I've got a buddy that used to deer hunt down there. And he, he'd say those places out there, you could go a week without seeing another human. Uh, it's because it's just thinly populated and he says dense woods and you hear all kinds of creepy crap at night. And that's why he quit deer hunting there. He said it was just really kind of creepy. And we used uh, to backpack up in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. It's the same way. It's a rainforest. It's uh, huge trees, old growth. And you, we went up for 10 days and didn't see any other people. And I, I was, I, was, I took my Glock 19 just because, you know, humans yeah. are the, the predators, you know, when you're out there and it's so remote. Yeah. Right. When I when I go camping, I take I generally keep my Glock on me, and I've got my yeah. kel KSG loaded with buckshot right on right at hand. <laughs> uh, Greg Price says the siege of Hanobia. That was an account happened in Oklahoma, uh, southeast Oklahoma, in I want to say the late eighties or early nineties, uh, where a family was basically held held captive in their own house as a number of Bigfoot tried to get into their house. Come to find out that the, that they were, what we're saying is uh, uh, because they had had deer meat that they had shot the deer. They were trying to get that. Uh, mm. and they, uh, the family eventually fled. Uh, but it, that's wow. a fairly famous story. Uh, Robert Miller says the Ozarks are crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of crazy legends around here. Uh, you know, some, some of them are probably just, you know, legend, but they say there's a, 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 a a, a grain of truth to every legend. Maybe a little moonshine. Maybe a little bit. A little bit. I've got cousins that still make that stuff. Right back. Okay. My grandpa I'll was a right drinker, back. so we we always took it with a grain of salt. But I, I believe him. I, I think that that his guys and him heard some stuff. Saw some stuff. Oh, I, I firmly believe it. Um, I've I've got family members that 
that have had encounters. I've had a couple of really weird experiences. I've never never seen one, uh, but I've had a couple of experiences that I, I just can't think of anything else it could have been. Um, I got I had something scream at me in a deer stand one night, and it wasn't a wasn't a mountain lion. It wasn't a, wasn't a uh, quote unquote panther. Bobcat. Panther. Yeah, it wasn't a bobcat. I don't know what it was. It was it was deep, and I, I could feel it reverberate. I mean, like I like feel it in my chest. Um, I never saw it. I heard it. Never saw it. Uh, I had something come up behind my deer stand one night, uh, waiting for the sun to come up. I heard it walk up, and it sounded. It was on two legs. The way it sounded, you could hear the bipedal movement. And uh, when I called out to them, because I thought it was maybe someone else coming up trying to hunt on the land, because I wasn't. I was the only one supposed to be out there. It was my uncle's property, and I heard a like a. And then it walked away. I never saw who it was. I tried to look around the tree and didn't see anything. Of course, it was still dark, and I didn't want to be shining a flashlight around because I didn't want to scare off any deer. But I just heard it, heard it leave. Um, had a had a deer kill go missing, and I found the spot where it bled out. And I mean, it was definitely dead. When I had it, well, the first time I hit it, it, it dropped, and there was a significant amount of blood, plus what we refer to as lung butter, uh, pieces of lung tissue. Mm. Uh, so I knew I hit him good and he wasn't going far and I tracked it and it went down into a ravine and I couldn't find a way to safely get down in the ravine. So I had to kind of b- sidetrack a little ways to get down into the ravine when I found a, a shallow spot and then then track back to where I was. And I found where it had hit the ground. I could see where the leaves were all messed up. And then I found where it fell and there was a significant quantity of blood there. So I knew that was the spot where it bled out. It died there. Uh, and from there I found nothing, not a drop of blood, not a track, nothing. If it had been a mountain lion or even a black bear or anything like that, there would be drag marks because it was probably about a 200 pound deer. Nothing. Wow. No, I I couldn't, I found some vague impressions in the leaf litter, uh, but no tracks because it was, you know, it was, it was fall of the year. I mean, you know, it was leaves everywhere. So I, I found no discernible tracks and I spiraled out for easily 50 meters. And never found another drop of blood. Never found the deer. Crazy. That one was nuts. And that was one of those those situations while I was looking for it, the woods were just dead quiet. Which is weird. <laughs> That's when you leave. Maybe yeah, I decided after a little bit to let that deer go. I'm like, yeah. Hey, deer than you, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that one's gone. <laughs> it was about a 12 point or two. I mean, it was a good buck. But you know, it was it was gone. No sign. Which is weird. I mean, generally you can track one. Have you heard anything weird in the woods up there in the Pacific Northwest? I've never heard anything weird. No, not that I, I mean, just, you know, cracking branches, this and that, whatever, but nothing that I can think of that's a monster or Bigfoot or whatever. Right. Nothing that scares you anyway. No, no. I, I mean, I still, you know, like I said earlier, if I go take a pee out there and it's pitch black and I have a headlamp, I see a silhouette. <laughs> My imagination makes up a silhouette out there. Yeah. Greg says, you know, when one is near, it's that something walking over your grave feeling. Yeah, I, I, I can I can see that. Um, I can t- I get a test to how quietly creatures in the woods can move. Uh, some buddies of mine and I, right after I got out of the army, we took a motorcycle trip and we were up, I think it was, it was in Idaho or Montana. We stopped at a, at a park and they were off dicking around somewhere. And I was just sitting on a log, just waiting for them to get done. I was tired of, tired of hiking and uh, I was going waiting, wait, waiting for them at a fork in the trail to head back to our camp. And uh, I'm sitting, just sitting there and woods are just normal woods. It's not, you know, nothing, nothing crazy. And I heard something behind me go, and I slowly looked back and there was a freaking moose like six feet away just looking wow. at me. Wow. And I just sat there and looked at it. And I never heard it walk up and that's a big animal. And I looked at it. I was like, oh my God, this thing is going to stomp me to death. And it kind of lowered its head and looked at me and snorted again and turned and walked away. <laughs> and wow. I never heard it come up. And that's a that's a lot of beef. Well, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of venison walking up on you. And I didn't hear sound. Pounds? Yeah, wow. at least. It was a big bullwinkle. <laughs> yeah, we saw a, a mother and a calf in downtown Jackson Hole. Pretty wild wow. in the winter. 
That's awesome. I mean, with the elk, ref- elk refuge down there, it's, you know, probably doesn't, isn't worried about humans. So, yeah. Have you ever had moose? I haven't had moose. I've had just about everything else. I've had black bear. Yep, I've, I've had, had bear, elk, had elk, of course, elk. Uh, all kinds of venison, mule deer, uh, white-tailed deer, black-tailed deer. I mean, I've had just about any kind of venison you could name. I haven't had moose. I've had caribou. It was pretty good. Tasted like venison. Um, just anything you can hunt in North America, just about, I've, I've tried. But I've never tried moose. I would like to. Uh, buffalo was really good. Or bison, whichever you prefer. But uh, it, it's really good. It's very lean. Elk's the same way. It's an extremely lean meat. But if you, get an, if you get an elk flank steak and tenderize it, and then marinate it. Oh, so good. Maybe cook it in one of those uh, those newfangled things that everyone is buying. What are those things called? Those <laughs> Instapot. 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 No, I uh, I took a, a meat tenderizer and tenderized the hell out of it. And then I, I uh, put it in a Ziploc bag. And this was a steak about an inch and a half thick and good good flank steak. And I soaked it in a, in a Ziploc bag full of carne asada and then threw it on the grill. <laughs> and it, oh. Yeah, it, it was it was very good. Nice. Wow. You, uh, I've, got, I've got a movie date with my boy at nine o'clock. So, if, if alrighty. Good, well, you know, we watch a movie, pick out a movie, and watch it tonight. So, all right. Well, I appreciate well, you hanging out with us. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, we've um, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, before you go, uh, give everybody your your information again. If they haven't checked it out, they I hope they do. And uh, and I appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, it was fun. You got me. My my website's down there on the bottom. There, I'm on. Facebook, Sean Chesser, uh, author, comma, author, I believe is how you find me on my author page. I've got a regular page, just Sean Chesser, that I uh, interact a lot with. Um, Pale Writers is the group. It's a private group, but anyone's welcome. And uh, Pale Writers is the team that my Special Forces guys belong to. And I got a pretty cool patch I had made up. That's I've got one cool. of your patches. Cool. I give those out as oh, prizes. Yeah. Had an art, artist. Uh, draw that up for me and had a patch company make them. So um, other than that, you know, Twitter, I'm hardly ever on Instagram and say, uh, I don't, I don't deal with those too much. I have them. I just so, don't ever mess with them. Yeah. I don't mess with them too much either. It's just too much. Well, as soon as I get some, some time here, I'm planning on burning through your uh, zombie apocalypse uh, series. Uh, I will definitely be reaching out to you just to, a uh, you know, fangirl and, and share the, I love this scene. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, I do you have one quick question before you run the Rikers Apocalypse series? Is it uh-huh. shared universe with the other one? No, it's not. It's set, it's set in 2016. Different universe, uh, different characters, um, different monsters, a little different. But uh, yeah, my, the protagonist is um, Leland Riker. He's a, a amputee from the knee down, uh, IED, route Irish um, in uh, Iraq. So he's, he was a driver, though. He was a uh, truck driver and dr- drive around some of the VIPs and up armored land cruisers, whatnot. And, and so he's back and kind of drifting around a little bit when the zombie apocalypse hits. And the promise is the first book. He goes and meets up with his sister and they've got something they have to do, zombie apocalypse or not. They promise to do it and they're going to do it. And that was the premise of that book. And you meet Steve-O. He's a character with Down syndrome in that book. And he's modeled after my real life cousin, Steve Piontek, who died when he was almost 50. And he was the coolest cat in the world when I was a kid, you know, I'm a teenager and he, country western music fan. He'd have his boombox and his Stetson and his boots and his pants were st- stark so stiff they'd stand up by themselves in the corner. <laughs> so I love Steve-O. it. You'll, you'll meet Steve-O in the first book, The Promise, and he's a really good character. He's that's his looking forward to reading it, man. Yeah. I will definitely reach out to you because, uh, uh, you know, you, you made another fan, you know, even before the show, you made another fan, so. Yeah, I love talking yeah. about anything. And pretty much, you know, airplanes. I'm an aviation geek. I'm a, I like, gosh, TV, pop culture. I like it all. Yeah, you post a lot of talk, cool stuff I don't on talk helicopters. Politics or religion with uh, with anybody. That's that's home and dinner table and whatnot. Mm-hmm. No, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing either. I'm pro two A. I'm not ashamed to say that. Pro Same pro lo- pro blue. You know, back the blue. Pro military. So, but yeah, I look forward to talking to you, Steve and and. Uh, DA, I appreciate it. Uh, Doug, Anytime, is that what I, can I call you Doug from now on since we've actually... Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I write okay. under DA and w- gotcha. my wife won't ever let me get a big head because she tells me that DA stands for dumbass. So <laughs> <laughs> she's quick to point that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're lucky to Love have it. it. 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, 30 years together next year. Yeah, we were born, at, or born, we were married in 93. So we're, we're coming up on, uh, this will be 28. This is 2021. Yeah, 28 for us. So. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Definitely congratulations. What's that? I didn't hear you. Just give our best to your family. Absolutely. Oh, we'll do. We'll do. Yeah. The two teens are doing better now that the lockdown's kind of subsiding. You know, we live in a pretty locked down state. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm just glad you guys are safe. You know, yeah. of course, here in, in Missouri, you know, we see the Fox News, CNN, you know, whatever Newsmax version of stuff. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie, it's scary shit. So, yeah. I'm, I'm no, glad I, you guys I, are, are well. I don't go downtown anymore. It's it's controlled. I by don't blame crazies. you. Yeah. Our mayor, just, Ted Wheeler, is a waste of skin. Just remember, Missouri is a constitutional carry state. Oh, yeah. Well, I hear there's more of those coming out. That's a lot of them. Texas just state. passed it. Yeah, I, I'm amazed that uh, my our sheriff slow walked my permit. They, the, I was warned by some other county sheriffs that I at the shooting range I go to, Clackamas County guys. They said you're going to wait a while for it, and sure enough, I waited quite a while for it. You know, I got a suppressor for my MPX. I got a little nine millimeter Sig MPX, and it mm -hmm. swaps between my Glock and my, and that took about nine months federal, which was better than I expected, and almost as long as it took me my CC and you know, my concealed permit to show up. Yeah. But yeah, it it will be okay. It'll it'll come around. Yeah, it's I got a dog. Kind of she, will swing the other direction. She'll tell Holly perimeter check, and she'll go and cruise around the backyard looking for squirrels. But she, <laughs> we have an alley behind the house, <laughs> just like the, the first book tried. There's an alley behind my house. That's my house. That I that's a house. Awesome. Uh, good times, you guys. I appreciate you having me, man. I, you know, time flew. Definitely. You know, Gotta, and we're coming up on a two-hour mark. Integrity. I, I will, and I did, and I told my boy I'd watch a movie with him, so I'm going to go do it. Absolutely. And you know, you family, that, family first. Always family first. Yep, that's you'll find that too, Steve, in the book. Saying, so, you know, I'll ask Raven what's the most important thing, and she says family. That's a fact. Sweet. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. like Steve said, my best to your family, and thank you for coming on, and I'd love to have you back sometime. Yeah, I'd totally be game, for sure. Anytime I, you want to do, uh, like, a, a book – uh, when you're releasing a book and you want to promote promote it, you know, yeah. hit me up. We'll we'll do a show, even if I've likewise. got to make a special one. Yeah, likewise. You need me to share anything, whatever. Just hit me up. I'll be happy to. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Yeah. All awesome. right, brothers. Take care. Have a good Take night. Take care. Be All safe, right. man. Yeah. I don't even know how to sign off on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I generally right. just ex hit the X at the upper corner. Hey, John, thank you for being on, man. If you know, if you we listen to this later, appreciate you having on, and uh, oh, you're, you're you're an awesome guy. And you write great books. He's a cool dude. I had no idea he wasn't military. Uh, yeah, that uh, I thought he, he, he told me he walk. wasn't. He de yeah, he definitely does his research. That's awesome. Well, you know, I uh, I didn't get to plug my T-shirt there. Uh, there Da, uh oh, Roger's in the hospital. You okay, I don't know how to find out. Um, that's uh, I uh, I don't have him on Messenger. And I'm not showing that's that's not good. Um Luis, if you could give me some contact information or reach out to me on Facebook. Uh I'm not finding not finding you. I I guess uh you and I aren't haven't connected on Facebook yet. Um, I'd love to, to find out what's going on um, and if, if there's anything we can do. I hope he's okay. Please please let us know. Yes, please. Uh, he's uh, he's one of us. He's family, man. Absolutely. I've known Roger a long time. I'm uh, Actually, I'm going to just see if I can text Roger directly. Hopefully, okay. he's able to take the text. Sure. Well. 
sorry, I'm, I'm not making any uh, any any noise. Um, Steve, tell us something. Oh, well, I was <laughs> I was starting to say before uh, before uh, Louise freaked me out there that uh, uh, I was you know plugging my new shirt that I uh, had to cover this week. Uh, first, the uh, DA Ex Machina shirt. Nice. And, uh, it's a, it's a great shirt, except for those two ugly bastards in the bottom of it. But you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they're on there, creeps. But I I love how long it is. You know, being a a, 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 a metabolically challenged American, uh, I like the <laughs> fact that my my gut my butt don't stick out when I wear it. Uh, but uh, I was very pleased plus. with it. In this one, they did get the logo in the back correct, so I actually have my my DA with the dog man and the and the Bigfoot on the back. Nice. So how are things coming along? With, oh, okay. How are things coming along with uh, Uncanny Valley? Going pretty well. Um, just plugging away. Uh, I've kind of got two projects going at the same time. It was the other day, other day on one of the Rogers shows. Okay. Uh, I'm going to text. Luis just sent me the his number. Okay. I'm going to text him, but I'm, I'm plugging away. I actually, uh, on one of Rogers shows the other day, I read a, a chunk of um, uh, the Wastelands of Ragnarok that I'd been working on kind of in the, in the back. Um, and oh, is that uh, the uh, sequel to Ragnarok Rising? Uh, yes, and um, it uh, I read part of that on the air and it had a really good response. So I'm kind of working on that in the background. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, that I can. I can do both projects at the same time. Uh, Wastelands is going to be a fun project. It's going to be more Road Warrior meets uh, Game of Thrones than it, because it sets it's set five years after the end of Ragnarok, and uh, there there's far less guns available, so they're relying a lot more primitive weapons. That's cool. Well, I think it'll be an interesting take. I uh, yeah I. Uh, uh, read that uh, William Forston uh, novel, you know, one second after uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I've been kind of taken with it. It's been in my mind a lot. And uh, I've purchased the uh, remaining two books in the trilogy uh, one year after and the final day, and I'm hoping to knock them out. Um, they're not very long, and I'm going to tear through those, uh, and then I'm going to dig a whole heart into Sean's uh, books because uh, uh, they, they read real, real smooth and couldn't put it down. It is pretty cool. Yeah. No, I, uh, I uh, hadn't had a chance to read those pages of uh, Uncanny Valley that you sent me. I'm wanting to do that in the morning. And uh, I, I had planned to sit down and read it, and I put everything aside to read Sean's book. So I would be a little bit more educated when we, uh, when we had him on the air. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of distracted there. Uh, oh, that's all right. Texted Luis and, and Roger posted on his his personal Facebook page. Um, he's at the Pomoni Valley Hospital. He says, I'm in trauma, not sure why. Uh, he's mm. been pushing really, really hard this tax season. He, the stress might have just caught up with him. God, I hope he's all right. Well, if he's in... I mean, I don't know how, how healthcare works in California, but here in Missouri, they don't activate trauma unless there's some kind of a, you know, a fall or some kind of physical injury. Right. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fall got, or a car accident. We've got nothing else. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, messaged, uh, I messaged Luis. That's the right number. I punched in the right number. He hasn't messaged me back yet. Um. Wow. Um, I will let everybody know as soon as we know something. Um, at the moment, kind of waiting to hear back from one of the people I've reached out to. Um, kind of 
freaking me out a little bit. I'm, I apologize, folks. Uh, sure. No, that's okay. If we need to, to wrap, my... we can. You know, um, um... Without knowing more. Apparently he was supposed to go out to dinner with family and didn't show when they went to check on him and found him passed out on the floor. Oh, no. Well, if he fell from a standing position when he passed out, they could have activated trauma for him. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe because they didn't know if, you know if he'd fell and hit his head. Or... Right. right. I mean, uh, uh, you know, he's not a huge guy, but I mean, he's roughly our size. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and you or bit, me. A little bit older than me. About well, almost a year. Either of us falling, you know, 200 pound man falling dead weight, there's some force behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we, I was planning on going for a while longer, but maybe we ought to go ahead and wrap up tonight so I can make some phone calls and make sure he's okay. Um, I want to thank everybody Family for first, tuning man. in tonight. I will, I'll let you know as soon as I know something. Um, I, uh, want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thanks Sean Chesser for being here. Um, I hope, uh, hope you guys are, are doing well. And, um, remember check out Sean Chesser.com. Uh, for his books because he's got some fantastic books out there and uh, also uh, make sure you swing by uh, mine as well daroberts.net uh, check out all of the new books I've got out and uh, all of the projects I'm working on and um, if you want one of the shirts like Steve's wearing I have mine ordered it's not here yet uh, you can find those right here that's awesome and just uh, you know on a personal note you know um you know, but uh, whatever your your um, faith or, or following is, you know, whatever deity, if any, you 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 subscribe to, you know, give us a shout out for Roger. Make sure he's you know, absolutely sending good vibes his way. Um, whatever whatever your beliefs, and and uh, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. I know I would if I were in his shoes. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we've got a great little family here, and you know, you guys are part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for everything. Thank you for all the support. And uh, I will I will post on my page when I know more. Uh, you can check uh, my, my DA Roberts author page. I'll post on there and try to keep everybody updated. So um, on that note, uh, again, thank you, Sean Chester, for being here. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you guys for all your amazing comments and support. And uh, we, we appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, Robert Miller says, tell Roger we're praying for him. I definitely will. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And uh, I want you guys to, to keep Roger in your, in, your, in your prayers and your thoughts. And uh, thank you guys for being here and, and have a great night. Thank you for joining us tonight on DAX Machina. Follow DA on social media and check out all his work at www.daroberts.net. Good night and don't forget to lock your doors.